Buenos días, Costa Rica. Buenos días a todos ustedes. Good morning, Costa Rica, and good morning, everybody. On behalf of the Global Center for Adaptation, I would like to welcome you very warmly to the Youth Adaptation Forum for Latin America and the Caribbean. Today, on the 12th of August, we celebrate the International Day Youth Day. My name is Adriana Valenzuela, and I lead the Youth Leadership and Education Program at the Global Adaptation Center, and I am very happy to be here today. The youth are not the leaders of the future. Youth are also the leaders of today. And each and every one of you is leading transformations in your communities. Today is a day to celebrate your energy, your passion, your commitment, and your leadership. And for that reason, from Costa Rica, I would like everybody to please stand and have a 10 second round of applause because we are being seen internationally to celebrate that commitment by youth to lead climate action. So 10 seconds of a round of applause, please. It is an honor for Costa Rica, one of the leading countries in the world in environmental matters, will be is hosting today this international event. And even more so, the University of Costa Rica. Costa Rica is one of the very few countries in the world without an army. And that money is invested in education. The University of Costa Rica is a public university, and it is an honor for them to be hosting us today. A round of applause for them. This is the seventh forum on youth adaptation organized by the Global Center on Adaptation. We started this year in March in Senegal in the framework of the Forum on Water. We continued to travel the world with the Forum for the Pacific region, Asia. We also went to Europe in the framework of the Climate Change Conference. We continued in New York in the high political level forum and today we are here in Costa Rica on the final event for these forums. The results will be presented on days three and four at a youth event where we will present these conclusions to decision makers and heads of state. This is a process to bring visibility to youth initiatives and to prepare recommendations for COP27 the adaptation and the implementation COPs, which will take place in November in Egypt. I would like to give a big thanks to all the organizations and people who have made this a possible event. This event started as an idea and many institutions have joined us to make it possible. So please, I would like to ask institutions and representatives to please stand to thank the University of Costa Rica, Pascal Please, the UK em Embassy and Netherlands Embassy for Central America, the Ministry of the Environment and Energy, Ivan, the Vice Minister, the Climate Vulnerability Forum, Matthew Javier Saramajo, the Youth Network, the Climate Change Youth Network in Costa Rica, the Climate Root and UNICEF. A warm welcome also to the youth who are joining us today from several countries. We have 
youth from El Salvador, Nicaragua, Panama, Brazil, Guatemala, Colombia, and also all the indigenous youth of Costa Rica who have traveled to be here today. Please stand. From the bottom of my heart, thank you so much to the Costa Rican people for receiving us, for hosting this event. I would also like to thank everyone who is following us. This event is being streamed live and also has a simultaneous interpretation in English and in Spanish. I would like to start this event by inviting the main panel for the opening ceremony to join us up here. The CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, Professor Patrick per Percoyen, please, Patrick. Pascal Giro, the ambassador. Ambassador Christine Pire, please. Vice Minister Carlos Isaac Perez Moya. And Chemi Gallardo, who is one of the um, indigenous youth representing Costa Rica. To start at this time, I would like to invite Jimmy. We know that Latin America is a diverse, multi-ethnic and multicultural region. And indigenous peoples play a key role in this process. You are, you are a leader who has organized the community to present solutions for sustainability and climate change. It's a great source of pride to have you with us. Please join us uh, to address the audience. Good morning. My name is Jamie Gallardo Sanchez. I'm from the Cabeca to the Caramanca Indigenous Territory. I'm 18 years old. It's a great um, honor and pleasure to have been invited to the opening of this forum. It's in the participation of youth in these types of actions where we are the main actors is very important. We can't say that the youth are the future because we really are the present. And so we have to change that and start working on that today. Indigenous peoples for many years have worked to adapt to the changes that have taken place in indigenous peoples globally. There have been significant changes, but the peoples have been resilient and have adapted to those changes to try to seek improvement for those peoples. Because as you know, indigenous peoples include a lot of the forests in the world. It is them who take care of the forest. And so we need a lot of support. How can I say this so that it doesn't sound strange? Oftentimes, big companies have a vision of the future to say, move forward. But indigenous peoples have a very different vision of what the future is. For us, we mostly say that the future is, first of all, our mother earth so if we don't take care of our environment and we don't start today there will be no future we feel that we are some sort of protection because it is us who can make our 
rights as indigenous peoples are, are stewards, not only of the environment, but also we have been adapting to the changes that have come up thanks to different organizations. We have given greater visibility to the work of indigenous peoples than ever before. It is known today that the communities have been working very hard so that we can have a bigger impact than we have had in previous years. We need allies, we need partners, we need a lot more people to join this movement, which is a movement that has to be done globally, not only in the territories, because we are the ones who have to change things today, not later, because there will be no later unless we do something today. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now I would like to invite the host, our host today, Pascal Giro, who is the director of the School of Geography of the University of Costa Rica, T teacher, trainer, a researcher, a professor, international negotiator, co-author of many policies, documents, and projects related to sustainability. The Paris Agreement states that education is key to approach the changes of climate, the challenges of climate change. Pascal, thank you for being here today. Thank you so much, Adriana, and distinguished members and panelists and uh, to our audience, I am so happy to be, to have welcomed you in our school on behalf of the provost of the University of Costa Rica, Dr. Gustavo Gutierrez Espeleta. This is your home as a learning institution. This is a space where youth has a voice and we are extremely happy to have this space of intergenerational dialogue on climate change in the framework of this Latin American and Caribbean Youth Adaptation Forum. In addition to welcoming you to the University of Costa, Costa Rica as uh, part of the university authorities, I also have to do some housekeeping uh, information to make sure everyone is safe. This room has four emergency exits, two on the sides, two in the back. If we were to have any emergencies, you are going to be taken outside to save rendezvous points. The idea is not to have everyone use this door that you came in through, but please use the four emergency exits in an orderly fashion. It's also important to point out that you have, uh, there are restrooms outside here and there are other restrooms in the cafeteria area. I also want to say that this is a space where we have to use masks because of university requirements. And the idea is to have this forum as safely as possible. So thank you for your collaboration. I would also like to thank the Global Adaptation Center, Global Center and Adaptation for having chosen the University of Costa Rica as the hosting venue for this event. I wish you the very best this in this um, space to put together a plan to make adaptation a priority and the implementation of the National Adaptation Plan and the adaptation policy that Costa Rica already has, we want to make that a reality. We will never be able to do that without the commitment and the active participation of each and every one of you, the youth. So this is the space where we can own these topics of, ad of adaptation and reflect your ideas and your specific proposals on climate action and adaptation. And I hope we can 
do that today. So thank you, everyone, and welcome. And now I would like to welcome amb the ambassador of the Netherlands and in Central America, Christine Bren. She is very experienced in negotiation and international affairs. She was one of the negotiators for the European Union in the processes of the climate change United Nations and uh, has also led adaptation matters. When we first started thinking about this event, we met with the ambassador and the entire team. And from the beginning, the ambassador said, yes, let us bet on this initiative and let's um, bet on youth. Ambassador, thank you for making this event possible. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. Ms. Kemi Gallardo representative of indigenous um, youth of the Cabecar territory, Mr. Pascal Herod, representative and dean of the School of Geography, which is what I studied as well here at the University of Costa Rica, Mr. Vice Minister, Jun Carlos Isaac Perez, and Professor Dr. Patrick Vergoya from the Global Center on Adaptation. It is a great honor for me to be here with you and particularly dear youth and um, other attendees. Good morning. I am very pleased to have the opportunity, the honor to participate in this opening event of the Latin American and Caribbean Youth Adaptation Forum today on the International Youth Day. It's very relevant to hold this event today on this date because we need to support all youth to create a future that will protect our planet and where everybody lives um, with dignity. Today, this is once again the most, um, the, the warmest, the hottest decade in the history of humanity. Global warming is a significant threat to our environment, our health, our safety, our economy, and our livelihood. The most vulnerable communities, the youth and women are most significantly affected. The risks associated to climate disasters are a reality for millions of people around the world. And every day when I open the newspaper, many times virtually, there are always articles about drought. For example, today in Mexico, we were talking to a representative from Paraguay where it's winter and it's 39 degrees. And so that scarcity and this impact is huge. Food scarcity, water scarcity are linked to large scale migration and conflicts as well. To build and maintain peace, we have to consider climate change as one of the fundamental causes of conflict and act accordingly. Science has made it clear that the world has to set much more ambitious goals. The future cost of inaction is simply too high. If we realize that science is talking about the risks of climate change and has been doing so since the 70s, imagine that. And if we compare the perspectives of climate action with, a sen with the sense of urgency required and the feeling of apathy in the face of a climate emergency, one could be discouraged, but we should never be discouraged or better said in the words of Patrick when we have been, as we have been talking in recent days, we have to be determined. The way we can move forward is by creating a possibility for everybody who represents the world today, particularly youth to speak up and for their voices to be part of the 
decision-making processes. I worked for almost eight years on climate change matters, as we just heard from Adriana. As one of the negotiators for the European Union in the area of adaptation at UNFCCC, and as head of the emergency aid division that includes climate disasters. If I see something new today, that is the activism of youth. And that is, and I, I am really excited about the leadership and the dynamism of the youth movement for climate change, climate action today in the world. Youth around the world have been the ones who have given phenomenal drive to the need to change things. Moving progressively among themselves, mobilizing with their families, their communities themselves, leading to an impact in the way that companies and cities act. We also see that youth voters are, uh, young voters are very active in climate matters and governments start to respond. Let us hope so. Climate change is moving faster than we can move. There are still fossil fuels. There are still carbon based plants and we still have we still have coal plants and there are still many things happening that should not happen and things that continue to happen and should not be happening therefore we should together take bolder action at the same scale as the climate crisis itself i believe that what youth what the youth are doing today is absolutely essential for this to happen and that's also why i am here today the kingdom of the netherlands as a signatory of the paris climate agreement believes that cooperation is key to fight climate change we want to support countries organizations and communities through the co-creation of solutions for global climate action today more than ever it is necessary to work together to increase knowledge and develop new ideas at large, large scale ideas that serve those who are in the most vulnerable positions. That's what this forum is for today on Youth Adaptation Forum. I encourage you to keep going, to maintain your drive, mobilization, and to demand more accountability and action from decision makers. Thank you very much for your attention. I wish you great success in your endeavors. As the ambassador has said, cooperation and co-creation of solutions for adaptation. And now I would like to invite the vice minister of energy and environment in Costa Rica, Mr. Carlos Isaac Perez. Vice Minister, thank you for joining us today. This is a new government. Costa Rica is a leading country. Thank you for being here and supporting this initiative and thank you to your team. The floor is yours. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be here again at this alma mater where I have been both a student and a professor several years ago. It is a pleasure to see all friends here with joint um, shared ideas and a similar vision of problems that we have to solve. I'm very happy to know that a significant partnership has been developed with various organizations and institutions and government representatives who support us for development that have made it possible for you to be here and have made it possible for this esteemed group of youth from different countries of Costa Rica, Central, Amer Central America, and other parts of Latin America and the Caribbean be here. Thank you very much to the Global Center on Adaptation for making this initiative possible. 
thank you also to the Kingdom of the Netherlands for making this event a reality to the Youth and Climate um, Change Network. We wouldn't be here without you. The Climate um, Pathway, I like that name. We have to build a way. We have made a little progress, but it is you who will be taking over in the next few years. We'll be taking making decisions privately, publicly, but maybe we already have a champion of climate change here, maybe a future Nobel Prize who will be leading many of the decisions on the global stage, because this is a global problem that requires global solutions. Thank you to the University of Costa Rica, the CVF, who has joined us also in this um, important regional initiative. Last night, as I was teaching a class to my students uh, of economy on climate change, I was also thinking of what I could tell you today, what I could share. And I was asking them what they thought about climate change and what they thought about the adaptation to climate change. And they have very similar concerns to the ones, the ones you have. And one of the things that I was saying to them is that they are learning about an instrument, an instrument to find solutions that is applying the concepts of economy to find solutions for climate change. But we have to be aware of the fact that these global challenges that require global solutions go beyond what climate change is causing, because we also have to combine medium and long-term situations with urgent short-term issues. 30 years ago, humankind was debating which would be the most important source of energy, the, the dominating source of energy, both in moving and fixed sources. Back then, for the technological reasons that we are all familiar with, fossil fuels took the lead. But back then, those generations were not seeing, were not aware of what could happen, what we are living today, decades ago, which you are suffering in a different way because this is a condition that does not care about a social condition or geography. So we all live this in different ways, sizes, and colors in a way. Today, we are in the same situation we were 30 years ago. What is going to be the dominating energy? There are many alternatives. Many of those were ruled out technologically. They have improved tremendously and they are being debated or discussed. We can not say that there is one dominating technology for moving in fixed sources. They are uh, progressing. We have to support them. We have to continue to do research and development. So, it may be that in this case, we won't have a single dominating energy or, or prime main energy, but we may have several. We have to keep working on that. And many of you will be working on that. Economy, ha the economy has changed. It is no longer what we used to see a few years ago. The pandemic has shown a different dynamic. We have a war today. There are other wars in different parts of the world, but this one has a very, this very unique characteristic. It has shown us how interconnected we are technologically, financially, in terms of supply chains and supplies. And so it's a problem that is being, is affecting from the outside our countries and we have no control over it. Economies like this one or other countries in Latin America that can control their currency or they can they can control fiscal matters have a, some play. There are some economies that are dollarized and so they are anchored in the um, money area and they can only play fiscally and they have greater constraints than other countries. Health is also different. We see it differently. We no longer worry about a single cold. Today we have significant zoonosis problems and that is also something that has resulted from climate change. Some of you will have to work on that in the areas of health in the coming years. Water is no longer what we see. It's a much 
it, it's a, a very critical resource. And in some countries, we know that no matter what the socioeconomical condition is, we all have to stand in line to get the, the amount of water we need every day, every year. As for food, we live in an area where there is food insecurity resulting from slow development events such as the such as droughts and so that takes us to discuss what are we going to be discussing meteorological or climate uh, things weather or climate both things are related it's no longer enough to know what, how warm it's going to be or whether it's going to rain or not we have to think of the medium and long-term events and how they affect our economy how they affect our society we have to project ourselves. We have to make take measures in that field. Look at the challenges that you will face over the coming years. And here we can develop a cycle, an integrated framework for climate change. First, we could be thinking that we have to meet one of the most relevant needs of every society, economic development, which at the end of the day will lead to social development. And that economic development has to bring well-being to society. But on the other hand, we also find that there is a situation that we are going through, and we see that from a, the point of view of the symptoms we have a significant impact on our natural resources and human resources. Because of the activities that we have been developing, everybody here is responsible for that in, um, for all of us and um, you as young people who are going to be taking over over the next few years. So we wonder the discussion on the global arena, mitigation or adaptation, both things are important because there are countries that have a significant responsibility and you know very well who they are in mitigation. And for us, even though we have a small contribution in the greenhouse gas emissions, we have to make a very significant contribution in adaptation in all economic activities without exception, transportation, farming, agriculture, um, housing, industry, health, and so on. So if we want to fulfill our desire, our, our challenge of economic development, let us think also of what should be the decisions that we can implement in economic growth. Also thinking about the current situation where some countries are going through significant inflation and some are in a state of economic stagnation and the answers or the bandwidth, if we want to use internet terminology, are somewhat limited in terms of fiscal policy and monetary policy. Technologically speaking, we have a significant number of options, many more than what were available in the past. And you see it all the time today. You're on your phone all the time, your computers, and you have access to a great deal of information and knowledge, but you have to be realistic. And you have to accept that everything you see there is not necessarily going to help you make decisions and good decisions at that. And I'm very happy that we're having this discussion here at this alma mater because you are learning and that learning will then be turned into experience and that experience is going to help you shape the future that you want and which you have said so clearly how important and how relevant youth are. Population is growing, demands are growing, consumption is growing, and we have to, to fulfill that part of economic well-being, but we need govern, governance. And when we talk about governance, we have to think about the direction that we want to have, the, the way that we want to go. And that is where we need to have a dialogue between public servants like ourselves who have left the private sector and or research and are now in the public sector serving you and you to get to that transition that we really need to work on climate change adaptation matters. And we have to discuss what we're going to do to emissions. We can't keep going with the level of emissions we have today. 
international decisions have been made, but the action is is um, what we are struggling with so that we can start to see some significant results. We shouldn't allow temperature to continue to increase or we have to find a way to control it. It's the same thing as what happens with our body. We can't keep living in that pressure pot. Some of you come from countries where the increase of the sea levels is very sensitive and you can't continue to lose more territory, more land, or seeing water being salinized in the coastal areas where there are significant populations. There are people from El Salvador. I'm very familiar with that country. And there are very strong populations, very large and um, great populations where you already see that impact of climate change because of the increase of the sea level and the salinization of your waters. We are living in an area where there are 1,600 kilometers that are being affected by drought. And depending on that location, it can be 10 to 400 kilometers wide. And there are countries where 80, 70% of their territory live with that every day. You will have to be in charge of finding solutions to that. So to be able to mitigate those impacts on our natural and human systems, but it's not valid to simply complain without bringing solutions to the table. It's not valid to just demand if we don't have ideas, suggestions, if we don't study, if we don't learn and generate that knowledge to be able to turn it into, a, into experience. That's the challenge for you over the coming years. Many of you are going to be graduating in your own schools, in your own institutions. You're going to be going into the private sector, maybe an, an NGO or the public sector. And you will make it possible for everything that you have learned to be turned into a number of decisions that will allow us to have a better world. I wish you the very best. I wish you success in this event, but also in what's coming over the next few years in your countries. And any concerns or any discussions that you would like to have with us, we are there to serve you because we also want to learn from you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Deputy Minister. We have to get ready. We have to face the climate change. Now it's really an honor for me to invite one of the great leaders of the world, which is at the helm of the adaptation agenda. Prof Professor Dr. Pratik Verhoyen, CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation. He's a university professor with more than 30 years of experience on climate, working at uh, many international agencies, and one of the leaders who really decided to bet on the adaptation agenda. Many years ago in uh, Paris, adaptation was not uh, on the agenda. Now it is. Now he's the CEO and he made a decision for the Global Center of Adaptation to be based on youth leadership. That's why we are here today, because of uh, this uh, leadership and commitment. Patrick, thank you very much for all this uh, program of uh, youth leadership. Please, let's give a big applause to Patrick. And before his words, we'll watch uh, a video of uh, all the uh, paths that we have followed in Costa Rica.
what's the situation here in Monteverde? Well, actually, the dry days are intensifying. It's not only 25 days a year, but it's over 120 days of dryness. Now, when it is raining, the rains are intensifying. It has huge impacts, not only on the people of Monteverde, but on the economies, on nature, of all of society. What is needed are solutions, adaptation solutions. Monteverde issued his own adaptation plan. It is impacting the agricultural sector, is impacting infrastructure, it's mobilizing youth communities, and it's building resilience across society. However, what is needed is these solutions, they need to be financed, they need to be replicated, it needs science, it needs data. Monteverde has a lot to learn from the rest of the world, which is advancing on adaptation. At the same time, Monteverde has lots to share. We need this local global interaction to build the adaptation movement globally. Patrick, the floor is yours. Gracias. Good morning, uh, young people. Good morning, young people. We need to hear you. Yeah. <laughs> because I wish I had good news for you today. But the reality is, the only good news which will come on the climate agenda, quite frankly, will come from you. Because my generation, 50-year-old white man from the, the global north, we have failed you. We have failed you miserably. Because if you look at all the scientific data, we just heard it from the vice minister. If you look at all the evidence which is piling up, if you look at all the commitments which were being made in, in Paris, when was that? Seven years ago. We should stay within 1.5 degree warmer world. We are not on track. We are failing you. In fact, we're heading towards a man-made environmental catastrophe. And I think Secretary General Antonio Guterres of the United Nations, he said last month, the Secretary General of the United Nations, he said, let me quote, we are in a collective suicide. But it doesn't have to be that way. And that is precisely, that is precisely where the forum comes in today. And quite frankly, that is precisely where you come in. And as Adriana said, this is the final forum of regional consultations uh, across the globe. And quite frankly, I cannot stress enough, I cannot stress enough how important it is that you get involved, that you take a stand, that you demand, and more importantly, that you take action now. And I think the Honorable Vice Minister, you referenced it. Wars, wars take many shapes. Let's take my own continent, Europe. There is now a massive war on the way, as you know, in Ukraine, with massive implications, not just in Europe, food prices up, energy prices up, inflation up, cost of living up, of a crisis which you did not cause. And on top of that, there is the climate catastrophe, a catastrophe which you did not cause. We see massive floods in the news, whether it's in the United States, whether it's 
In Europe, we see heat waves, we see droughts. So, colleagues, friends, young people, the climate emergency, the climate emergency, I mean, the Honorable Director just referenced there are four exit doors for the emergency, but the climate emergency, it has arrived and there are no exits. There's one planet, there are no exits. And it will become much worse. We know, even if all the pledges were to be implemented and we're not on track, we will be in that 1.5 degree warmer world. When? 2030, eight years from now, you just graduated, you're just on the labor market. The climate emergency has arrived. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because as we are in a battle against extinction, I mean, just imagine this, a battle against extinction. This battle should be fought on two fronts. One, of course, where you already are very active. We need to mitigate, we need to lower our carbon footprint. We know that. You're very active. Every Friday you collect, you demand action, and you should continue to do so. That's one war front. But there is a second war front, the war on adaptation action. We need to adapt now to the impacts of the climate emergency, which we are experiencing today and which will become more intense over time. And that is the focus. That is the focus of today's discussion. Because let us not deceive ourselves. Even if the Paris Agreement, remember 2015, all these world leaders on stage like this, on stage, this is what we're going to do, 1.5 degree world. Above that, not safe. 2030, we're heading towards that. But even if we were to implement all the Paris commitments, the 1.5 degree world will have massive implications. We see the climate emergency today, well, you know what? It's a 1.1 degree world. Every fraction of a degree of warming has massive implications. What I always have learned is that there is strength in numbers. Just look at the statistics here on my page. There is in the world right now 1.8 billion young people between 15 and 24. 1.8 billion people. That's a fifth of the global population. So imagine the potential influence you have of 1.8 billion people driving this war on two fronts. I have one very simple, extremely simple message for you today which is this, investing in climate adaptation, investing in making our agriculture food systems climate resilient, investing in the roads so they're not being washed away, investing in infrastructure so it can withstand the heat stress, is not only in your interest, it's not only the moral right thing to do, it makes, as the Vice Minister said, it makes economic sense. If you want to change the world, you want to take to leaders, if you want to take to finance ministers, you want to take to the business community, the moral argument is important, but the economic argument will do the trick. Someone said in the United States, and I think the ambassador um, knows who it is, it was Bill Clinton, it's the economy stupid, it's the economy stupid. Because every dollar, every euro, every pound, every colonist, invested in climate adaptation has a much higher return on investments. Let me give you another statistics. This region, Latin America and the Caribbean, if you act, there's a choice to be made, it's very simple. If you act in climate action, if you act in climate adaptation, 
15 million jobs will be created. Let's think about the alternative. If you don't act in climate adaptation, if you don't act in climate action, 2.5 million jobs will be lost. This is a jobs factory agenda. It's your jobs which is on the line. So that was my first message. Another message which I want to share is, and I discussed it with the ambassador um, two days ago when we met with um, President Rodrigo Chavez, a bold leader. He's one of the good guys. Let's be very clear. He is one of the good guys. And the conversation which we had is, we're not pessimists. You're not a pessimist. You may not be an optimist, but I'm sure you're being determined. So what we as the Global Center on Adaptation, what we have done in Africa. So two weeks ago, I was in Kenya, where we launched the largest, the boldest, the most impactful adaptation program for the African continent. What is it? $25 billion over five years in agriculture, in infrastructure, in youth and jobs, in climate finance. Should that, not, should that program, that Africa program, which is now running, it's up and running, finance is now flowing at last, should, not, should we not replicate it here in Latin America and the Caribbean? Should that not be demanded by you, that the leaders embrace it, put it on the table, get the funding behind it? And I think we should. On another statistics, which you may find compelling, if you don't invest in climate adaptation in this region, over time, which is soon, national economies will lose 1.5 to 5% of their GDP. Just think about it. 1.5 to 5% of GDP of economic outcome, outcomes being lost. And that might sound abstract to you, right? I mean, 1.5, 3%, 5%. Think about, think about the students who can't access their schools and universities because the roads are washed away. Think about your mothers and sisters who can't access the hospitals during the floods to deliver their newborns. Think about your brothers, your fathers, who can't work the fields, the agriculture fields, because the droughts prohibited them to have their yields. Think about these implications. But again, it doesn't have to be that way. Because we need to realize world leaders, whoever I meet, whether it's in Africa or Asia, or in Europe or North America, or even here, the standard argument is, well, investing in climate adaptation, it's really expensive. And true, we need upfront investments, obviously. But think about the alternative, not investing in climate adaptation. That is expensive. What is missing, though, and you saw it from the little video. I mean, I went to the field in the last few days, as I did in Africa, I did it in Costa Rica. You see this solutions they exist whether it's in the farms whether it's in the rainforest whether it's in infrastructure but what they miss what they fundamentally miss what they miss is scale it's not a solution from one farmer or 10 farmers or 100 farmers what about the whole country becoming climate resilient that is what is requ required what it fundamentally is missing on this agenda is the political will to invest in climate adaptation. Because, let's not forget, let's go back to Paris 2015, or let's go back to 2009. You, have even, you weren't even perhaps born, at least some of them, at least the front row, my son, <laughs> was not born. We, the Global North, promised to deliver $100 billion of climate finance every single year to flow from the North to the South. Where are you right now, scorecard? We are the university. We have failed. We have not delivered that. So I think it's extremely important that you raise your voice and you come forward with concrete solutions and say, you know what? This is what I'm doing. It requires scale. This is what I'm doing. It requires finance. This is what I'm doing. It requires support from the government, from business, 
from civil society. That is what is required. So I was in Mount Verde, you just saw it, right? I think someone's even, is someone here from Mount Verde? Yes. Who is, who is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, from Mount Verde. So you saw there this little image where I stand with the vice minister in front of the landslide, and she said, we always had rains, we are in a cloud forest. But now the dry, the dry days are much more um, extended, and the rainy days are much more intense, and hence we have landslides. So what you see now, the weather, the climate impacts you see across the globe on television, whether it's here in Costa Rica, whether it's in Honduras, whether it's in Guatemala, whether it's in the Netherlands, whether it's in the US, it is now front and center on the news. And there is this expression, I'm not sure whether you heard this expression, to make the weather. You should make the weather. And what it means, it means those global leaders who change the arc of history are being coined as they made the weather, they made this transformational change. And I believe, I believe, each one of you in this hall, each one of you online, is capable to make the weather, to drive this transformational change, because it requires one idea to go to scale. One idea, one big, bold idea to go to scale. So I'm very keen to hear these ideas today uh, during this forum and afterwards. So let us all make the weather. And in, on a more personal note, yes, I'm an old man, 53. I mean, Adriana introduced me 30 years of experience. Well, that makes you feel very old, which is true. Uh, I'm here for the first time. I've never have done that before. I'm here for the first time and I brought my family to one of these events. And in fact, indeed, and it's here in Costa Rica. So, <laughs> and in fact, I want, let's say my two sons, one is Nicholas, the blonde one, and the other one is Vicente, to stand up. And, and the reason why I asked them to stand up is this, and, and, and there is also Cast, the best friend of, of Nicholas, bo uh, both climate changes in the Netherlands. Nicholas is from the Netherlands, as you can see, right? Blonde guy, quite handsome, I would think. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have Vicente. From where? From Chile. So if, let's say, in one family there can be this connection between the continents, let us work together to find the connection between the generations as well. I started by saying, we have failed you. But it doesn't have to be that way. So what I hope is that today's um, conversation is bold, is very practical. You don't need to tell us here on stage that we have failed you. We know that. But I think it would be very helpful if you could tell us your idea, what we can do better, and how we can support you in driving this agenda forward. In closing, let me go back to, let's say, my new friends from Mount Verde. So yes, I saw the landslide. Yes, it is dramatic. Thank God no one's killed. But it was very significant economic loss. We were also in the children's eternal rainforest, walking around in the rainforest. And the guides were very proud to say, well, actually, we have restored this. And it was degraded first, but now it is intact. So I asked the lady, I said, why children's eternal rainforest? Right? I mean, rainforest, yes, but why children's eternal rainforest? Well, what happens to be the case? In the 80s, there was a scientist who studied that particular rainforest in Mount Verde. And he traveled to Sweden. And he was in a classroom. And he talked about sort of the degradation and the massive de deforestation of that rainforest. And it was one kid, 12 years old, a girl, of course, raised her hand. And she said, 
Can I not buy that rainforest? Can I not just invest in that rainforest and then decide, say, well, how much money do you have? So he opened those pockets and there was something there, maybe not much. And he said, well, let me mobilize the whole class. And you know what? what she said? Let me mobilize the whole school. You know what she said? Let me mobilize the whole country. He said, you know what? I'm going to mobilize 41 countries, which she did. One idea to invest in that particular rainforest. She has never seen in front of her eyes. She was from Sweden. One idea which she brought to scale. And we've seen now the extraordinary impressive children's eternal rainforest. So it's that level of energy, but particularly it's that level of boldness and determination. We can do this. So I want to thank you for coming here today. I want to invite you to be as aggressive as you can be because my hope, my expectation, my inspiration, and my commitment to you is this. Let us seize this opportunity for a climate resilient future, but let us seize it today. I thank you very much indeed. Estamos escribiendo un nuevo capítulo en la historia. We are writing a new chapter in history and we'll take the opportunity to build a sustainable and retainable uh, future for climate change. We'll invite uh, the people of the network of uh, climate change in Costa Rica, please come here with us. They, they will uh, give each of our decision makers uh, back with a presence. Maybe one of the photographers can be with us. And now, each of you has a t-shirt in their bag. We invite you to wear the t-shirt. Y vamos a tomar, en este momento necesito su colaboración. Uno. I need your help so that each of you wear this t-shirt. This is a symbol to show our commitment with this cause. We will take two pictures. We will invite uh, everyone the, from the network to be here. We'll take one picture here on the stage. Good. Is it on? Oh, here, come on, Papa.
Ahora quiero que todos ustedes se queden ahí y que por favor Now, todos ustedes please stay where you are and uh, I want uh, you to stand up. In row 13 and 14, you have letters behind your chairs. Please get your letters and lift them. If uh, those uh, who are on the back, maybe you can uh, come to the aisle so that uh, you are part of the picture. So we want you to lift the letters. And uh, please, uh, we want uh, the people at the back to come to the aisle. And uh, let's uh, stay closer together so as to get everyone here. Please get closer. Vamos a esperar un minuto. Entonces, cuando nos diga el fotógrafo, el fotógrafo nos va a ayudar y vamos a decir todo. Let's wait for a minute. And uh, when the photograph tells us, photographer tells us, we'll say Costa Rica. One, two, Hands up. Thank you all. Thank you, Costa Rica. Thank you all. We invite you to a coffee break, 20 minutes for the coffee break. Uh, please uh, visit the adaptation solutions. And in 20 minutes, we'll uh, come back to the intergenerational dialogue and uh, solutions for climate adaptation. We'll be back in 20 minutes.
Sí, tal vez. Puedes volver a hacer más. Ok, usted me dice, llevamos cinco minutos. Empezamos. Ok. ¿Qué hora es? Once y Sí. Buenos días. Good morning. Sí, estamos bien. Bueno, vamos a retomar las actividades. We are ready to resume our activities in these 10 minutes because this is a space for youth. We're going to start by setting the guidelines for the climate change acceleration with some concepts on adaptation and climate impacts in Latin America and the Caribbean. My name is Ina Rodriguez and I hope this will be clear. Before we start, I would like to invite you to join our mentee. You can take this, write down this code or just um, take a screenshot. La pregunta la vamos a dejar para el final porque estamos teniendo problemas técnicos con We're el going to leave the question for the end because we're having technical problems with the internet right now. So before we talk about adaptation and mostly for youth, it's important to go back and clarify what it is that we understand by climate change. Climate change has its first definition in the framework convention of the UN for climate change, and it is defined as climate change attributed directly or indirectly to human activity that alters the composition of the global atmosphere and it's added to the natural variability of climate observed during compatible time periods. That's article one. And for us to understand it, we have to understand that our atmosphere generates naturally greenhouse gases, but scientific evidence has proven that human activity has been the main driver of greenhouse gases that today have led to global warming and have led to climate change. Some specific data, the greenhouse gas concentrations are at the highest level in 2 million years. 75% of the worldwide emissions of greenhouse gases and 90% of the CO2 emissions come from fossil fuels produced by human activity. And along these lines, here we can see well no we can't see it but what i wanted to show you with this 
is how the planet is getting warmer so we can see the scenarios for Latin America. But maybe just to add, the temperature of the Earth is now 1.1 degrees cent Celsius higher than in the late 19th century, where the last decade is the warmest recorded to date. And in the effects that this implies, because our problem is not climate change, but the global warming that we are seeing, and the main effect, the effects mainly for Latin America and the Caribbean, which have to are connected with extreme hydrometeorological events, where we can see longer droughts and rain in uh, lower periods, but with greater impacts. So, for example, floods, tropical storms, tropical cyclones, cold waves, and extreme temperatures, but it also has implications in other planet systems. For, ex for example, the degradation of the soil, the loss of biodiversity, the increase of the sea level, the increase of temperature, which had been mentioned. And specifically, as part of the damages and losses, this is an information that is shared by the climate pathway. These are some data specifically for some countries in the region where we have information that has actually been reported in the nationally determined contributions about losses. And here we only see the millions in dollars, even in events that could be a single day. For example, Honduras, where a single event left thousands of millions of dollars in losses plus the human lives affected and the people who were displaced. So this is not new for us. And even though we cannot make a distinction between how many of these events are the result of natural variability in climate change, that has led to create projections of how we're going to see the impacts of climate change for our region, specifically IPCC this year published eight key risks for Central America associated to predictions for the end of the century because of the increasing temperature, where extreme droughts are going to be associated with food, se food security. Floods and landslides can, be, can have greater impacts affecting life and infrastructure. We are going to see greater water insecurity because of the differences in the quality and quantity in water distribution. An increase in vector diseases and possibilities of epi um, epidemics and the, the overburden uh, on infrastructure and public services because the infrastructure is not prepared for the events that are coming up. This significant deterioration of the bioma in the Amazon and the increase of the sea level, cyclones and coastal erosions, where even though the increase of the sea level can be seen in slower scales, cyclone waves can be seen at 600 meters inside the coast. And that's something that we are seeing in Central America. This leads to a key need for adaptation because when we talk about climate change, we generally talk about mitigation, but re emission reduction is the simplest measure. Specifically, IPCC defines adaptation as climate adjustment processes that are actually projected and their effects in human systems where adaptation intends to modify damages and take advantage of beneficial opportunities in some natural systems, human intervention intends to facilitate the adjustment of the projected climate for. But what youth need is we need to adapt to the effects that we are seeing and those that we are going to see. Along these lines, Costa Rica has a national adaptation plan and a national ad adaptation policy and plan that has very clear where we seek to strengthen the capabilities and conditions of resilience, reduce vulnerability, and where we seek to talk about damages and losses and leverage opportunities and create better opportunities. Along this line, we could generate sector groups where we need to lead our measures, such as food security, water resources, biodiversity, infrastructure, tourism, and health. And to give you some specific examples of how we could see adaptation measures, we need 
agricultural and, and forestry diversification initiatives to contribute to food security and biodiversity, a naturalization of the riverbeds to minimize the impacts of floods, a restore of coastal habitats with restoration measures for the areas and recovery of the forest coverage where indigenous communities have to lead because of their knowledge and their extensive experience. An increase of urban zones with green zones, we cannot continue to see separately the um, human growth separately from green spaces where we need to reduce superficial runoff, mitigate hot, hot heat islands and improve biodiversity, for example, with specific measures such as green roofs, blue roofs, rain gardens, improving the infrastructure, in adding soft solutions or natural solutions to manage runoff of rainwater. Because when we talk about adaptation, we don't only have to talk about adaptation based on ecosystems or communities, but we also have to think about urban zones that are already there and how we need to adapt them. And as part of the plans that we have in Costa Rica, there are six axis of action where we need to act in order to get to these measures. For example, the management of um, knowledge on the effects of climate change, where we need to create a link with governance spaces, not only in the governments that make decisions, but joint work spaces with the different levels and the different sectors to have a more effective advocacy on the measures that need that are needed in the communities, fostering the conditions for resilience in human and natural systems by planning both along the coast and in the sea. And this is very important because, because like I said, we continue to see it separately, but it's necessary for us to add conservation and restoration within the instruments of land planification or territory planification. The management of biodiversity ecosystems watersheds and sea space for adaptation. And these are some of the pictures of governance spaces because we need to take action and not only wait for the governments to agree on what are the best spaces for to, uh, for us to act in, but to leverage the existing spaces, municipal emergency commissions, development associations for communities, climate change commissions, the ONGs that are working from the communities the NGOs that are working from the communities to grow as a whole and to generate initiatives that adapt specifically to the context of each of the locations. And these pictures at the bottom, for example, also show the work of the network, the Climate Change Costa Rican Youth Network with other NGOs like Diego Ambiental, working with indigenous communities on restoration matters. We also need actions and public services with resilient infrastructure and adaptation. This is a picture from a news report in the municipality of Pocosi in Costa Rica, where we are working on climate shielding. Many times when we talk about adaptation, we don't necessarily associate the topic of infrastructure. And because this is an area where we have so much rainfall, we can't forget about this and we can't just have a news report. This should be an access in their policies or housing construction codes, for example, we need actions in productive systems so that they are better adapted and more eco-competitive investment and financial security for climate action, where we need to accelerate the transition of the food systems and the economic systems, not only working on mitigation. And to reinforce the topic of governance, where we need to work with the different levels, national and international, regional, local, and the various sectors. This is an example of how youth has shown that we can advocate and we need to continue to advocate. In the first picture, you see a, a, it's a picture of, of COP21, where the network worked with the then minister, Andrea Mesa. We have there have been approaches for initiatives with UNICEF and um, camps because we need not only political action, but also directly with communities, with youth, and they are all just as relevant. The Costa, the Costa Rican Network for Youth in Climate Change has also been an example of how we can continue to do activities to continue to grow and to attract youth who want to raise their voice and positioning because we need youth to take that anger and that frustration that we have so many times when we see the decisions that are made at a political level, 
without spaces of governance to turn them in, into actions where we bring the opinions of the youth and all the vulnerable groups that deserve to be represented. And these are other images, some other images where youth can lead not only to take advantage of spaces where we are applauded, but where we are heard and considered when a decision needs to be made. And before I finish, I would like to add a personal note. Oftentimes when we talk about these topics, we are positive, but sometimes you have to have uncomfortable conversations and youth, young people have an important role in that area. Climate change is not the problem. It's the symptom of an economic system that we created and to face it, we need adaptation, but that's only one of the solutions. And in this solutions, young people have to continue to raise our voices, to advocate and continue pressing for to accelerate adaptation solutions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Irene, and the recommendation. We need youth to be part of decision-making processes. We are now ready to continue with another participation from someone who has made this forum possible. Since we started, we first thought about it jointly. And I think this is an example. We need these kinds of intergenerational and intersector alliances and partnerships. This event is possible because we have international organizations, the government, civil society organizations, youth and the academia, and that is what we need. And I would like to invite Ivan Delgado, who's the director of the Climate Change Office in the Ministry of the Environment and Energy, who is also someone who is fully committed and who has made this event a reality. Ivan, thank you so much. And please join us up here with this vision of the problem of climate change and the opportunity it poses. Let's receive Ivan. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Good morning. And some three months ago, I saw several young people in what we call the Framework Convention of the United Nations. And that is a space where we meet and we speak. And there are many countries present there. And let me tell you that several years ago, in 2009, there was a lack of hope throughout the world. Every country is getting together in the Framework Convention. You are guilty, Holanda. No, it's your fault, Brazil. No, they're responsible. The Americans are responsible. No, the problem is the cattle in Argentina, Mexico. You continue to drill for oil. Arabs are the ones who have us in this situation, have put us in this situation. And then someone raises her hand, a small country called Costa Rica. And let me tell you that at that time, at the COP, the framework convention of the parties in Copenhagen in Denmark, Costa Rica said, we don't have historical responsibilities, but we want to be part of the solution. Everyone was speechless because it was, uh, it was, everyone was blaming everybody. And we said, no, we are not contributing to greenhouse gas emissions practically at all, but we want to be part of the solution. And at that time, someone said, we want to be the first carbon neutral country in the world. By when? By 2021, when we're going to be celebrating the bicentennial of our independence. 
when we were two years away from the bicentennial, we took the football and we pushed it to 2050. Why? Why? Because this country, in terms of carbon dioxide emissions, does not contribute anything to the world. Where are the true problems that we have in this society? Not only in this society, and that's why I'm going to ask that we go to the first slide. The problem is in Central America. You and I live in one of the most vulnerable areas when it comes to climate change impacts. Madam Ambassador, Patrick, I would like to say something to you both. This country lives in this area. Everybody here has volcanic eruptions, landslides, earthquakes. And in addition to that, we live along the main way of hurricanes, storms, and cyclones. For you, is it it's new to hear about a hurricane? Is it strange to talk about a drought for you? In 2008, we lived one of the greatest strategies in this part of the world, in this small part of the world. We are a vulnerable region exposed, fragile, sensitive. We are a region that also has a lot of direct losses. Direct losses, we lose a bridge, workers cannot come in, supplies cannot go out, tourists cannot leave if, if a, bri a bridge collapses. But we have a banner saying that we are carbon neutral but we continue to move forward towards the accumulation of losses and damages because of climate events. How much is a, an earthquake in Costa Rica? Oh, we have calculated $800 million over the next 10 years. How much are hydrometeorological events? We have calculated over $300 million. And that's not an investment. It's not like we had budgeted for that in public spending. It's part of public money that is being lost. Why? Because we are still paying for those problems that we had in the 90s. We still have damaged bridges from Hurricane Nate and Otto. When I Look at this picture, this picture, you know what it shows? For me, it shows hope, it shows solutions, and it shows answers. And you know where the hope and the answer lies? Here, and I'm seeing it with my very eyes. It's youth is the, re the answer and the solution that the world needs. Let us not keep with a discourse of vulnerability and exposure and poor us and what is missing. We have fertile land. We have people who are trained, educated. We have the women who are fighting to survive in the face of a climate emergency. When I see this image, you know what I see? I see droughts and behind droughts, the girls who migrate due to climate events by themselves. And it's something that's very touching when you see young people acting the way you are acting today, welcoming them. Men and women, boys and girls who are visiting us, we open the doors to our country, to our heart, but I don't want you to take this picture as showing a vulnerable region. I want you to see it as a picture that shows answers and that sometimes the people who create the problem want to sell us a solution, but the solutions are here. The answers are here. Okay. 
This was in 2008. I have been collecting since 2006 information from newspapers. So I've been doing this for years. I eat climate change for breakfast, for lunch, for dinner. And when I come home, I kiss my wife and I say, my love, we are trying to do something. When I see my children, my two kids, 10 and six years old, I say, we are trying to do something. But when I look at these pictures, this is the reality. It is absolutely right. The issue is not climate change. You and I live with storms, with floods, with droughts, with volcanic eruptions, with earthquakes. In addition to that, we have climate events. And so let's, that, that are, that affect us directly. This is the phase of climate change as well, climate variability. But not only that, for me, the problem is not in the sky, it's on the earth, how we are organizing ourselves, humanly territories, how we are giving the best technology to our farmers, how we are giving the best tools to our fishermen, how we are giving the tools to you, not only giving them to you, but also how we take advantage of the tools that you give to us so that we can serve you in the best possible way. You may remember Nate and Otto. You may remember, but let me remind you about a few months ago when we had the um, storm, we were all paralyzed with 15 minutes of uh, rainfall. It's crazy for me that we hear about that and we don't think about fighting going to work with the communities and on the other hand we are thinking of going to negotiate in framework conventions you know what greta said no more blah 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 no more blah 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 damages and losses help us fund find the funds. Uh, when I look at 76 communities that are paralyzed, when I see this, I see the mayor of Acosta. Do we have any, anyone from Acosta here? Acosta was paralyzed for five days. Acosta had no water for three days. Acosta had no electricity, no power for four days. Communities could not communicate. And so what did we do? We worked interdisciplinarily with the local emergency commissions. And climate change people were looking at the cops. No more blah, blah, blah. Where are the main problems in our countries? Losses and damages. The question is, and I bring it here, I put it on the table with all due respect, is this a problem of climate change or is the problem the way territories are being organized? Is climate change the problem or is it the environmental degradation that we are causing in the territories? Is the problem climate change or is it that we are not including the voice of youth in public policies? It's very easy to call everything climate change. A bridge collapsed. The problem was climate change or the problem was that we have terrible design, poor construction, horrible operation, and very poor maintenance. It's so easy to say that it, it is climate change to blame. Many would want us to call this a climate emergency, and it is. It is. We have gone from change to crisis, and today from crisis to emergency. 
But whose emergency is it? Go look at Spain. Burning. Go look at England. Airports are paralyzed because the roads are melting, because the runways are melting. It is an emergency. And here we have beautiful weather. This tie is the tie of the greenhouse gases. I take it off because we're working on adaptation. We're, work, we're going to be working on adaptation. We're going to be working on losses and damages. And I need you to join the way we work in public policies. I make my, a commitment from the Directorate of Climate Change to support your technologies, to support your thesis, to support your research, to support our, we have our, our people from Fidelitas who are doing great work with environmental rights. And I am making a commitment to you. You are the voice. Adaptation is the human face of climate change. A greenhouse gas is not something that I can touch or hug or cry about, but I see adaptation. I embrace it. I cry for it. And I find it here in all of you. I don't know what else is coming in the presentation. And I really don't care. I just want us to raise our voice up in the world, because if there is a country that can bring solutions and answers, it's Costa Rica, Central America. And if we don't do it ourselves, that's an, a bad message for the world. No more blah, blah, blah. No more blah, blah, blah. And if you'll help me, we can all chant it together. And I'm sure the world will hear no more blah, blah, blah. 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 Good morning. Así como le dijo Iván, Ustedes son la respuesta. In the same way as Ivan said, you are the answer, you are the solution. This is the work and the action that will allow us to build a resilient Latin America, a resilient planet. Let's go on now with an intergenerational panel. We want to invite Maida Molina, uh, representing youth in uh, Nicaragua, Maricel Navarra, uh, Navarro, youth of uh, Puerto Rico, Priscilla Gonzalez, indigenous uh, representative from Costa Rica, Joyce Menems, members of youth of the Global Center, also uh, uh, Ms. Patricia Portela Sousa, representative of UNICEF in Puerto Rica, uh, Joyce uh, Mendes, Jorge Morales Leiva, Maite uh, Marina, please. Uh, let's uh, welcome them uh, with uh, strong applause. Hello, hello. Perfecto. Vamos a tener unos micrófonos acá. Eh, so esta... we'll have microphones here. This morning we had an opening ceremony that was extraordinary with the messages and a call for action. And now we'll have this intergenerational dialogue uh, about uh, the role of young people to uh, accelerate climate change and their impact. The dynamics will be simple. We want to listen to your viewpoint. Let's start with a question for the four young leaders 
there's a gap uh, in the decision making at a global level and uh, very few women are uh, have the leadership of this uh, climate change so welcome we are really proud to have four young women with this uh, message of hope let's uh, start with uh, you joyce please tell us about the challenges that you as young people uh, face and uh, which are the solutions that uh, you need and uh, what you need in order to implement uh, good morning i'm i usually talk warani language in Paraguay, I'm uh, Joyce Mendes, and very happy to be here. I'm talking uh, like a young leader and also with a young consultant working with the governments and specialized groups in order to organize uh, climate adaptation. We know the needs of our communities we know the solutions. Our grandparents, our culture told, of us, told us about solutions, but the important thing is how to get to funding, how to monitor funding, how to get uh, technical uh, capacities, how to develop abilities and how to develop project development in adaptation. That is very important. When we are in uh, local uh, meetings, uh, we think about mitigation, but adaptation has a further meaning. Also, the main issue from my perspective as a young consultant for UNICEF is that we need support in order to uh, get to our goals and negotiate. We need more young people in the NGOs. Nowadays, we only have 4% with child-centered policies or including youth and children. So without you should help us with our government. We should go from proposals and protests to action. We need technical uh, abilities translated uh, into local languages. I'm the first member of my family who speaks English and who got a master's degree. This is not a reality for the rest of the people. We need materials in the indigenous languages. Please help us. Wonderful. Materials should be translated into all languages to uh, relate it to cultural context and the language of native communities. Let's go on with uh, Priscilla. You are also from an indigenous community of Costa Rica. Tell us uh, the challenges and your ideas about what you would like to be seen and what you need to move forward. Priscilla? My name is Priscilla Gonzalez. I'm uh, from the community of Uruca, territory of Uruca. I'm a mother. I represent many community groups, cultural groups. And now we are starting with a group of uh, native women. In our community, uh, the role of women is not taken into account. And uh, this has to be known beyond our community. 
in projects we are considering uh, planting new trees in the territories there are problems with water what's exactly the question basically uh, i want you to share the challenges the problems uh, you, you have in your community and what is needed to achieve uh, solutions to make solutions come true the challenges are mainly that uh, young people are not taken into account in the community we have to, to have a new vision to move forward there are many challenges in fact we have a different outlook we need help in recreating some projects. Some of these projects are moving forward. We need technical help and funding so as to start this process. That's all I wanted to say. Perfect. Um, Mike, you come from Nicaragua. Well, what's your vision? I'm Maite Molina, I'm from Nicaragua. Our first challenge is when we write uh, our thesis and uh, people, uh, some young people want to get into maybe a lake or a place, but uh, when we try to do that, uh, many doors are closed. They don't want us to do any research but uh, we know that uh, investment is needed here. Then when you are, when we are young professionals, it's really difficult to find our first job when you have uh, no experience. In my country, many doors were closed too in my country. So uh, this also implies us, it, climate change. I have been uh, working in a community in Santa Teresa and these communities are highly vulnerable to climate change. Access is very difficult, especially when th there are floods. It's really difficult to get to those families there's no funding to give response to disasters. Young people are not taken into account in the local organizations for uh, disaster. And it's mainly men, adult men who are there. And there's no um, gender perspective there. Thank you very much. Priscilla. Priscilla. You have already told us something, but which would be the actions that uh, you think should be implemented? Well, in our territory and also beyond, we need more opportunities, we need access to 
the land which are in the hands of other people and the, the local population have no opportunities to work these lands as native communities uh, we should be able to have the right to these lands and women in particular should have further opportunities to children too with Uh, we have, uh, as a community, uh, we have ways uh, to grow. And the owners of the land have their crops. Uh, they share their crops. This uh, could be something that could be escalated, really. It's a good idea, and uh, we could take advantage of all that. Marisa, you are from a network of uh, uh, young people from uh, Costa Rica, what are the challenges or things to develop? Well, happy uh, Young People's Day. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm really happy to be here. Something I would like to say is that uh, participation of young people in decision making is really necessary. It's true that uh, there are young people should be uh, trained uh, into understanding what we say about adaptation, but uh, some of us have been able uh, to get to uh, further education at university and uh, we can start uh, acting from our communities because with all the activities up to now it's really clear that actions should start at communities and should be escalated until we get to solve all these problems and get to the ideal world we want. I have worked thanks to the opportunities I have had. This is uh, 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 an organization about water. These organizations uh, have taken advantage of human resources in their communities to replicate adaptation in uh, community activities and they need funding in order to go on with these activities. They are a group uh, taking uh, all the products of the region of Guanacate and all these could be escalated if we had the funding, but we don't have it yet. We are trying to get it. Another example is the network of climate change. There are uh, agents of climate change and we were able to go to schools in order to train young people so that they go to their communities and apply some of the adaptation measures. Our work is voluntary. So it's not sustainable. We need to uh, get uh, resources to uh, turn it into sustainable actions for the young people so that this is sustainable in time and we can apply measures uh, that escalate all this. 
activities. It's really important. We know what to do. We know how to get to our communities and ask them what they need and give them technical support thanks to the fact that we are educated and we are organizing teams so we can uh, take into account a, a wide range of areas but we are not sustainable because we have no funding we have all, all the will we have the knowledge we have the energy but well, we need funding. Thank you very much. So we have listened to the need to have access to the land, to education, financing, agriculture, food security, uh, empowering uh, young women, and children, technical assistance and material according to the local realities. We have two decision makers. I want to invite Patricia Porter. Like the, he is a representative of UNICEF in Costa Rica, Anonym from United Nations with uh, many programs for young people, for children, and for climate change. Uh, Patricia, uh, thank you for being with us today. What can you say about the impacts of climate change on children and young people, and what uh, UNICEF is doing to give support to young people? We have shared what all this uh, uh, young people uh, have told you. What can UNICEF uh, do to help them? Uh, 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 can you hear me? Well, good morning. I'm really so happy to be here on internationals. Today, we celebrate uh, the International Day for Young People uh, at this house. Thank you very much, the University of Costa Rica. Uh, this is really important to be here talking about uh, this subject at this university, about uh, climate change, really growing so much in Costa Rica, important in Costa Rica and also beyond in the rest of the world. Climate change is important for Costa Rica and for the world. I am lucky enough to represent a, a country uh, which has uh, climate action at the forefront. It's not only about policies. It's about young people. Here, we are trying to get young people and children too. So really congratulations to the network, to the GCA, to all these, you see, aren't all these agencies that really made it possible, young people made it pop, uh, possible. My neighbor from Paraguay, my colleagues from Nicaragua and Costa Rica, from UNICEF, how do we consider this issue of climate action, climate change. For us, climate crisis, climate action is urgent. Why? Because this is related to many years of achievements in terms of children 
and young people. We developed an index about the risk for, uh, for children of climate change. And there we could see the uh, impact of climate change and the consequences of decisions taken before before decision makers were uh, took actions that uh, now we can see the results we have numbers and evidence about this impact all children on the planet are exposed to at least one of the climate threats and half the children globally live in one of the 33 countries that are most affected by climate crisis. We know these countries could go back if we don't take action now. But uh, really, many years of development and progress are at risk now. And this uh, integration of young people in public policies after two years that have been so difficult with pandemic and climate crisis, uh, climate uh, crisis really adds to this problem in the Caribbean index shows that nine up to 10 children are exposed to two threats, children and young people in our region are threatened by the consequences of climate change and one out of four children or young people live in areas affected by four threats. As my colleagues have said, this is an emergency and we need action. There are lots of schools, uh, for instance, here in Costa Rica, who have been, uh, which have been damaged and closed this is human cost, a financial cost. Action is needed not because it is a right in terms of children, social inclusion, especially children and young people who are staying behind because of inequality and the climate change really increases this inequality. There are several issues, but let's talk about what we can do, what they have just said. I think this intergenerational dialogue is fundamental. <laughs> when they said a panel of young people, I really was doubtful whether I was a young person, but we have to know where we are at. I work at UNICEF here. Young people organized everything, uh, including, I mean, the main issues in my speech, they were organized by young people. In uh, Costa Rica and in the region, we have to support these young people, these children. And we have to make sure that they take part and they are empowered. I want to thank uh, the young, the Youth Forum for Climate Change, all the activities uh, young people are organizing around climate change. So young people should be empowered. They should participate and 
Costa Rica, as Joy mentioned, has this climate uh, change uh, reflected in the policies of young people. So there are policies and implementation. It's not only a paper. We have implementing the policies for children and young people for the next uh, 10 years for the National uh, Council of uh, Children and Young People and also in the Ministry of Development. And there we talk about adaptation to climate change as one of the main issues, apart from the traditional issues of uh, uh, food participation and the rest. So this is reflected, adaptation is reflected in this policy. First is participation, and then policies and problems should have the voices and the actual participation and action of young people. And yet another issue is to promote governmental and non-governmental organizations, the different alliances to make sure that uh, policies are implemented. Policies and programs have to be implemented in the whole territory. This is Latin America and the Caribbean. And one of the main issues for uh, uh, just uh, equalitarian and uh, sustainable development have to do with the uh, gender issues, with uh, environmental issues. So the political policies have to apply to the whole territories in our agenda. Those are the main issues here. So it's not only UNICEF, but all agencies should be together around this issue about adaptation, uh, climate change, economy. This will be the focus of cooperation of uh, United Nations for Latin America and the Caribbean. Thank you, young people working uh, in this uh, cooperation program in United Nations, UNICEF, FUNUD, UNPD. Uh, the idea is to advocate the country in climate change with all these young people helping us, helping our work through the group of interagency of young people in United Nations. We keep on working, fighting, and intergenerational dialogue is fundamental because we can rest on their backs, we can hold their hands and we can uh, advocate, help them in funding and empowering. But you are the leaders of uh, this fight. We are here to support you in order to keep promises so I hope that in five years, we'll be able to get together again and uh, we will uh, listen to a new story, a story told by you, young people of Costa Rica and Latin America. It's a pleasure for me to work with you. La respuesta es colectiva y estamos construyendo. Is collective and we are building a new story. I would now like to invite our CEO of the Global Adaptations, Global Center on Adaptation, Patrick Bergoyen, to 
respond somewhat to the various visions that have been posed by the speakers, and then we will open the space for you to be able to share what it is that you're thinking, what actions you have in mind, and how those initiatives can be supported. So, Patrick, please. Well, thank you so much, um, Adriana. Um, first, uh, I would say that's quite a profound moment right now. Why? It's the first time, first time in 30 years, <laughs> first time in 30 years ever, on my case, that I am joining a full female panel. So I think that is an extremely... <laughs> Because we know if we give the keys of the world to women, I think we are much better off indeed. So my reflection, if I can be um, frank, is threefold. What I heard from um, the women on stage, what's, what I hear from when I travel around the, uh, the globe, one this profound issue of access to finance. It is extremely, I heard it today when I was in an exhibition, I heard it last night when we had the dinner with the ambassador. You have the ideas, you have perhaps already even sort of a little business starting up. But if you knock on the door of a bank, it's very difficult to get a loan, right? Because you don't have a credit record, you can't, you can't get started. So this access to finance issue is extremely important. Yes, we can talk about the COP, we can talk about COP27, and we can sitting at the table, important as it is, but part of the solution is being in the economy of adaptation as a youth leader running your own business. I think it's very important. So what we have done as, as Global Center on Adaptation, this is just one example. In Africa, I just remember what I said, we have the largest adaptation program in Africa. So in Africa, one of the four pillars is exactly on youth, not just youth sitting at the table, and then I talk to a young person and a young person says something back. No, supporting youth enterprises. So we have launched a youth enterprise award. In a sense, it's a competition. Thousands of enterprises, young people like yourself, came forward, well, I have this idea. I have a drought-tolerant, uh, uh, drought-resilient uh, crop um, production factory. I have four people uh, now on the books. I want to go to 20 people. I want to go to 40 people. So we collected all these sort of submissions. And the winners were received $100,000. $100,000 worth of training. How do you write a business plan? How do you pitch an idea to a, bank, a commercial bank? How do you go from scale one to scale um, um, 10? That is now happening in Africa. Concretely, building up young enterprises. And I think we should do something similar here in this region. That is one. Secondly, What separates us here on stage is not just the gender issue, right? You're women and I'm a man. What separates me from you in the audience is not just our age difference, you're young and I'm old. What mainly separates us, and this is my strong conviction, what separates us is your ability to dream to dream about big things, bold things, a future which is possible, where my generation particularly thinks what is not possible. We're playing in a small sandbox, so to say. So my request to you, I know we're gonna open it up to, the, to you in a dialogue now, but my request to you is also this. It's one thing to have a dialogue today, August 12th, here in San Jose, I say my things, you say your things. The litmus test of impact is what's going to happen on a Monday morning. What is going to happen when 
the flags are down, the flags are down, the camera lights are off. What's going to happen then? I think it's extremely, extremely important today. It might be a little bit of a disruption of the program. We have all these cameramen here. That each one of you, each one of you here present today, takes the time this afternoon with the camera team here to make one short statement, 30 seconds on camera. I am so and so. I'm from that particular community. I want to share with the rest of the world one bold idea. Because I think it's vital that we collect. We collect the voices from the front lines. And as I alluded to, on September 3 and 4, right, that's basically in a couple of weeks, these, these regional fora, they come together in a global sort of summit kind of moment. I think it's vital that the energy which I feel here in this room, but particularly listening to the exhibition, listening to here to the, to the colleagues on stage, it has to become practical. It has to become extremely practical. Just sharing how important this agenda is will not change a damn thing. Sorry to be so explicit. We need to hear your voices with your concrete ideas. So my third piece is my request to you when we open up the intergenerational dialogue right now, but particularly also afterwards, go to the camera, say what you have to say, and what you think needs to be scaled up, because I think that's part of the solution. And my commitment is this, is that your voices from the front line will be front and center during the youth summit on september 3rd and 4th where we you will be uh, convening together with heads of states and government thank you very much indeed como patrick lo ha dicho es un momento muy emocional es un momento as patrick has said this is a very emotional moment a moment of joy and hope it's the first time in history that he has been on a panel that it, where all the other panelists are women, and he's sending out a key message out of Costa Rica, the need to empower women and girls to participate in the decision-making processes and the implementation of climate action. So what we're going to do next is we're going to open the microphone for you. We're going to do that in an organized manner. We have the guys from the Youth Network of Costa Rica who are helping with the microphone so we're going to take a few minutes and the idea is that whoever wants to participate can do that we are going to have a brief introduction who you are what country you're from what is the idea that you have and the idea that you want to share with the world and what would be needed to implement it so you can raise your hand and we're going to ask the kids from the network to bring you the microphone who would like to go first So let's see, we're going to start back here. We have representatives of the indigenous communities of Costa Rica right here. We have someone here and then someone here. Please introduce yourself. Un, dos, tres. Eh, bueno, buenas tardes. Buenas Good tardes. Afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sonix and I'm from Limón in the Matina community, which is kind of in the middle of Limón. Thank you very much for the presentations and the comments. They have all been very valuable and they help us as you young people grow our knowledge of the topic. My comment and question, I am a professional in uh, orientation, so I'm in the first line of mental health from a, an educational um, approach and psychological approach. I work with mental health. So we have heard 
of the damages and losses, but also of non-economic losses, intangible losses, those that are not palpable. And one of those is IPCC mentions five sleep issues, suicide. It also talks about stress, anxiety, and depression, and post um, stress traumatic disorder because of extreme events and slow um, simmering events. It, I worry about this because we know that in Costa Rica and throughout Latin America, we have an issue with mental health care. It is deficient itself. It's very poor. The process of um, mainstreaming is just starting in Costa Rica and it's just starting in Latin America. And we are worried that this non-economic damages, non-intangible non intangible damages are not taken into account. Why are mental health damages, big mental health issues damages? Because those who are affected mostly by mental health issues are children, teenagers, and youth. And so these are issues that end up excluding students from the educational system. So we talk about the right to health, right to education, the right to life, because the loss happens when it's impossible to fix. And when someone commits suicide, we're talking about loss of human life that happens during adolescence. I'm from Limon, so in Talamanca, it is, has one of the highest suicide rates of the country. Talamanca is a region where 80% is protected by a regime of environmental protection. And I feel that we have to count them there because not even in Latin America and in Costa Rica, there hasn't been a way to count those intangible, non-palpable economic losses. So how are we doing? What is the path to recording those losses and what are different countries doing to record those losses um, and damages that are non-economic, non-palpable, specifically those that have to do with mental health. Adaptation is also giving the mechanisms to have access to mental health, prevent damages and losses is also mental health. So I think that's an aspect that we all need to work on throughout the country, but particularly populations that are being affected, that are already vulnerable, and populations that are already in human development rates that are low, such as the area of Martina, where I'm from, or Talamanca, which has the highest suicide rates. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Melissa Rojas. I'm from Buenos Aires, Punta Arenas. I am very glad to be sharing with you today, young boys and girls who are students and who are visiting us from different countries. I represent the Sur Association. I am a project manager, and I would like to second the words of um, our colleague Priscila Gonzalez on the topic of food sovereignty and reforestation of the land and the need for international cooperation for these projects to be executed in the southern area. As we know, we go to the government and the government because of the situation and the economic debt, they may articulate something, but sometimes projects do not go forth and it's impossible to make progress. We represent 62,800 indigenous people of their territory according to the INF census. And we want that support from international cooperation, um, Patrick, so that they can they can help us. And we would like to request a virtual meeting so we can implement, as Ms. Patricia Portera was saying, an implementation of the policies and not stop at blah, blah, blah. Happy Youth Day. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. My name is Yulisa. I'm from Alajuela. I'm, I'm the general coordinator of Wang Sing Foundation. And I wanted to take 
to say something because my colleague was talking about funding and funding is very important for the past three years. I tried to find funding for my foundation, finding a way that we could generate results. I first did it because of the great love that I had for my foundation. And then I realized that a project that we're going to raise funds for a project, but there will be other projects and will we be able to find the international funding or some funding, but we can't depend on that funding. And so that led me to work with other organizations and realize that everybody is working for the most part with limited resources. So my call is for many of us belong to organizations and come from other countries. And the best way is for us to work together that has to do with private sector technologies. What we are doing, we can't be working from our organizations with limited resources and our actions continue to be limited because we are we're not working together. And if we have 50 million columns in one sector and 50 million columns from another sector, so why don't we have 100? million columns instead. Why don't we all work together for a single thing? At the end of the day, our actions cannot be separate. We should be working together. And it's the only way that we can overcome this crisis and this emergency. Because responsibilities continue to be shared, everybody with different levels of responsibility. But the only way to move forward right now is for each of us to do what we have to do and so that we can share the technical things that we can get people some people have the technical know-how some others have the money some others are in the community side i don't live in the beach but whenever i meet with communities or people from the communities i couldn't really do anything without the very valuable information of those who live the reality day in and day out. So for me, that is the call that we can ask for money at an international level that is going to be spent. Money is spent so quickly, faster than we realize. And one year you have a project and the project is dead two years later because you didn't think about sustainability. You didn't think about what you were going to say when the funds ran out. And because at the end, of the day, you didn't generate links that or networks that are important. Hola, ¿qué tal? Eh, mucho gusto. Mi nombre es Benjamín López. Hello, Soy... my name is Benjamín López, and I'm from Guatemala. But this beautiful country of Costa Rica has allowed me to study a postgraduate a master's program in Cartago. So thank you to everyone from Costa Rica. It has been great to be sharing with you. And someone I wanted, someone was saying that we shouldn't complain without providing solutions. So I wanted to present a micro company in Guatemala. We have also taken it to Panama and it's called Flor de Tierra. Flor de Tierra is very concerned with the degradation of soils. Soils are more and more assets because of the chemical application, nitrogenated uh, fertilizer, generate a lot of nitrous oxide, that's a greenhouse gas. And today nitrogen is one of the earth um, limits that is out of control. So that's one thing that we have to work on. We have been doing a lot of research with some institutes such as ICA, but we have also taken some knowledge from our old um, culture, which is the Mayan culture. And we have developed several technologies where we have worked on workshops for producers to learn to make the products that we can sell or for medium-sized producers, we sell them elaborated products, products that are fully organic and have been approved, have been proven scientifically based on microorganisms and fertility, soil fertility. The idea of uh, telling you about this is first of all, sharing this with decision makers where we don't always, always have an opportunity to do that. We are in Guatemala, but we have been participating in some events in Brazil, Panama and other places. And what do we need? We need a decision. We want to 
escalate the idea. A year ago, FIDA recognized this as the best conservation alternative in Latin America and the Caribbean, but it hasn't gone further than that. So that alternative is there not only for decision makers, but for other organizations that we can network with, that we can liaise with. And um, regardless of the country, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook as Flor de Tierra Guatemala. And this space has been an opportunity to show our products. It's a space between dialogue and science, but we have also created another initiative that is called Atuleo, which you can also find on Instagram. And what we do there is we also explain the same thing, but with videos so that this will be available to everyone because at the end of the day, someone said there are emergency exits here, but our, can our planet has no emergency exits. And like our Mayan people say, if I'm well, my community is well. If my community is well, I will be well. So thank you. I hope you can follow us and we can work together. We will have two more questions or comments, and then we will come back to our panel for their comments. Good afternoon, everybody who is here today. Thank you to the organizers and particularly a big hug to the people of the network who have been working since very early today to make this forum possible. I think it was Irene who said that talking about climate change implies talking about uncomfortable things. And I will touch upon some of those uncomfortable points that I find to be my favorite. The first one and most important is that the youth in Costa Rica are facing unemployment and also a systematic violation to their labor rights. We need access to dignified employment. We need our labor rights to be respected, minimum wages, access to insurance being paid. Um, we cannot work if we are working in conditions that violate our human rights. We need financial sustainability. And for that, we need universal income. And the truth is that this is a very thorny topic, very difficult and complex around the world, but progress is being made and evidence shows that universal income guarantees dignified conditions for a dignified life. And I think it's important that, that as youths, we drive this topic forward and decision makers also work on these matters. And another favorite topic for me is sexual and reproductive rights. Youth in Costa Rica is facing a systematic violation of our sexual and reproductive rights. In Costa Rica, half pregnancies were not planned. We need legal, safe, free abortion. We also need conditions for dignified maternity and motherhood, for women who decide to be mothers to be able to be mothers in a dignified manner because it's not worth, it's not valid. It's unfair to have only minors who live in homes that have money for them to have a good childhood. That is not fair. That's perpetuating social discrimination it's unfair that only people who have money can live well. Also, dignified menstruation periods. In this country, most schools have no menstrual menstruation products in their in their uh, bathrooms. If I am at school and I have my I get my period, I have to go and ask someone for products or go and pay for my own products because in this country, periods are individual burdens. And that, should, that is not fair. We pay a tax for bleeding, and that's not fair. We need dignified menstruation. And that also implies changing the sanitation system so that they can consider the differentiated pollution they produce. And I think also among the young population, we have a lot of solutions. But it also happens because we don't have access to dignified employment and decision-making positions. We also need decision-making positions and jobs. Most people in the government are not young and that doesn't change quickly. We also need data because right now I cannot tell you how many young people are in the government. I don't know. So I'm, I'm just giving you an estimate. I think everybody believed me, but I have no way to prove it. And lastly, 
I think it's also important to say that even though the contribution in emissions in Costa Rica is low, I breathe polluted air every day. And that violates my human right to healthy environment, which in Costa Rica is a constitutional right and has been for almost 30 years. We need to have a transition to public transportation, efficient, electrified, low in emissions, no more. There is no time. And we also need the agricultural uh, sector to work on it and start polluting, start, stop polluting, stop polluting our rivers, stop polluting our soils. That is our future. And we also have everybody here has an important role in demanding these changes and demanding that these changes that are part of our future take place today. Thank you. Hello, thank you, Annie, for that. My name is Luis Francisco Ledesma, and I'm here from Funder Conservation. We are working on educating environmentally about mushrooms in Costa Rica, but I'm not going to talk about that today. Today, I'm here about I'm here to remind you about the big environmental challenges in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is being threatened by reviving illegal mining in the north. Costa Rica is the country in the, the world that has the highest in, rates of agrochemicals in our foods. Farmers need to use so many agrochemicals to be able to use the very little money that they are generating and they need to be using agrochemicals constantly and that has led to an increased consumption in our country and right now we are among the highest um, global indices in costa rica indigenous leaders have been murdered and those crimes are unpunished there is also a proposal being put forward to make uh, the road to limon bigger and they want to destroy the forest of Braulio Carrillo. And there is also a significant problem in urbanization. In Loma del Salital, there's still pressure to urbanize or to develop that area that is one of the last green areas of San Jose. The neighbors are defending it, are advocating for it, but the municipality in the area is not listening to them. Costa Rica also has a problem in agro-industry because there is a very significant crop that is exported worldwide, which is pineapple. And the pineapple producers in Costa Rica are systematically violating human rights and the right to healthy quality environment. That happens every day and it's not being made visible. And I'm here to remind us of these big challenges that we have in our country because there is this generation of people who are thinking that natural resources have to be exploited, that we still have to live in that context where nature has to be destroyed for us to develop what um, they want in the future. And there are plans to do oil exploration and exploitation projects in Costa Rica. And this is a generation of people who want to make Costa Rica go backwards with its great environmental leadership worldwide. And I think today, at this time here, we have to say no to all of these threats that people want to come and implement in Costa Rica because they have the political and economic power to do it. We have to do that counterway. We have to be that intergenerational and youth counterway. And just as this intergenerational forum is proposing, is putting forth proposals, we need to demand from those people who don't see Costa Rica as green and environmentally sustainable, we have to say no to them. That is not the development that we want. We want sustainable economic development that is based on nature solutions, based on youth solutions, and based on climate justice.
Muchas gracias a todos ustedes. Entonces, lo que quiero... En este... Thank you, everyone. So, what I would want to do next is if we could get one of the microphones up here again, and I would like to give an opportunity to respond to each of our panelists, maybe a 40 second, 40 second final reflection. Maybe, Patricia, we can start with you and then we can pass the microphone along all the way to the end so we can finish with our, Patrick C with our CEO, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you for this dialogue. Entonces, mi desafío aquí, de acuerdo, cada vez que ustedes hablaban, de, es verdad, es verdad, el tema de salud mental súper crítico, el tema de, de derechos de las mujeres súper, súper crítico, el tema laboral. We talked about agrochemicals. We may start with the gaps we have to close when you think about a specific group of children and young people. Mental health is a critical issue. It's not only here in Costa Rica, Latin America, the rest of the world. It's really a worrying issue. We are working at it. The solution cannot uh, get to just uh, to this. We have to think collectively All these challenges, please count of us. Uh, we we have our ambassador for uh, from the Netherlands. Uh, thank you very much, ambassador, for your support to these young people. We are learning. I have dreams. My dreams as are to be able to tell a different story. I'm not working for, I'm working with children, with young people, with great challenges. But we cannot just uh, leave here and thinking about, well, funding is not enough. We have to think about closing gaps, think about gender gaps, but we should never divide environmental issues from social rights. All rights are connected. We have to think collectively and in a holistic way. Please count on our support with a professor. I think we are all allies because what you see, we see too. We analyze. We have to develop this framework of cooperation. There are young people working with us. We can make it better. Please count on us. And I think that a better world is possible. I think having 14 young people from uh, Costa Rica in the last uh, COP. And uh, there was a guy who got uh, 30,000 signatures for a file, Antonio. But you have the solutions. 
14 young people from Costa Rica were at uh, COP working together. Young people took part of the development in uh, Costa Rica. We are together always. Thank you very much. Uh, very quickly, I would like to think about adaptation, uh, gray, green, and uh, Paraguay is one of the most uh, uh, anxious country to, to do that, to use a mechanism called you report. And this uh, uh, year's issue will be uh, climate anxiety. We developed with uh, UNICEF 10 questions in order to know what we can do to adapt not only young people, but also children to this new reality, to live with climate change. It's really very strong to think about this, to think what's coming in the future. So oh, from vocational area and health areas, uh, we wanted to make a, a video about uh, uh, climate uh, anxiety, inviting all the young people from Central America and South America and the Caribbean. Hello? Well, my answer to Dr. Patrick, uh, what I need is concrete, specific projects, what we need, how we need it, and how we are going to do it. That's what adults expect from us. One think is using about geographic information for agricultural insurances. I would like uh, the embassy and Mr. Patrick to listen to him because it's really very interesting. Uh, in terms of all the uh, speeches about uh, about uh, mental health in Nicaragua, we noticed that, that all the places where this place uh, people were sent, uh, I mean, there were vulnerable vulnerability issues. We have uh, to consider uh, housing that is secure and this is also related to uh, reproductive and sexual rights that were also mentioned by uh, the attendees. I would like to close saying that our voices are so loud that now they are listening to us. So now it's the right time to keep on speaking loud so that we can be listened and we should sit down and put all these into action in terms of specific actions in the different communities, the uh, youth and the climate change network uh, is open to work with all of you to start working together. So, because we are present everywhere in our countries. Well, thank you again for the possibility of being here. All these projects are really great. My colleagues told me to work about uh, projects uh, related to sustainability, to uh, forest conservation. And it's 
important for you to see that in our lands, we, in our territories, we apply all this sort of in native, uh, in a natural way. I want to thank you because this is a great opportunity for us to be talking to you, to be sharing, because really we do not have too many opportunities to share. So this is really important. Well, thank you so much indeed. Let me um, go back first to our representative from Le Mans. And you referenced um, COVID and what we can learn from sort of the disruption of the system, including on the impacts on, on mental health. And I just wanted to add another side of that dimension of what we learned during the COVID crisis, because let's not forget, during the COVID crisis, the global north managed to mobilize trillions of dollars overnight to invest in the global north so now with another system shock the climate crisis let's remember winston churchill who said never waste a good crisis never waste a good crisis now with the planet on fire but particularly also now when the climate emergency has arrived very clearly in the global north as well. People in Europe, people in the United States, people in Australia, people in Canada, they can now feel, they can sense now, this is not just a global south problem, this is not just a, a problem for the future. I think it's vital that we now turn up the heat and, and, and make use of this crisis and turn up the heat on policymakers, one. Secondly, what our friend from uh, Guatemala said and the representative from Buenos Aires, solutions exist. And I'm sure this afternoon we will hear about more solutions. But also with the solutions, we need to be inclusive, not just modern science, but also build in indigenous knowledge into these solutions and scale them up. I think that's very important. And related to the practicality, it's extremely important what works needs to be scaled and needs to be shared. I think that's a very um, important uh, aspect as well as a second point. And my last point, I know in my remarks, I spoke a lot about the economics of climate adaptation, which I strongly believe in. But what you said and what I heard on stage is also very, is extremely important. This is after all a rights-based approach. A climate resilient world is your fundamental human right, which you deserve and which you should demand. So you spoke about jobs. I think the lady there, you spoke about jobs and dignified jobs. I think it's very important to realize that investing in adaptation is in essence investing in dignified jobs so for you to raise your voice on a rights-based approach which is the right thing to do i think it's fair to say you are on the right side of history i spoke about making the weather in my remarks as a sort of a metaphor of changing the arc of history and i'm convinced that together in this room here today driving this movement forward that the adaptation action agenda is unstoppable. I thank you very much for, for your commitment in this regard. Un agradecimiento muy especial a todos los miembros del panel por hacer. Thank you very much for all the panel members to make this so inspirational to feel that we are really building a new story and that we are doing so holding hands on this uh, young people's day so please let's give a great applause to 
our speakers and to you too. So please, we'll I'll ask the speakers to stand up. We'll take a picture. Aló, aló, aló. Gracias. Bueno, vamos entonces a continuar con la agenda de este foro de jóvenes de adaptación para América. Let's go on with the agenda of this uh, forum of adaptation of young people on, that is being celebrated on the day of the youth from the University of uh, Costa Rica. So I want to, to welcome the young people who have traveled in order to give us their input. Uh, we have young people who have traveled from other parts of the region and uh, I will invite them so that they tell us their experiences. You also have a card where you can write your adaptation uh, solutions 
and uh, your okay. commitment the commitment of what solutions can be implemented. I want to welcome all the speakers. Uh, there's uh, Ms. Maida Molina from Nicaragua, Judith Barrera from El Salvador, Abdiel Douglas from Panama, Camila Herrera from Monteverde, Costa Rica, Joyce Mendes from Paraguay, and Jose Villoldo from Guatemala, and Maria Jose Arasha from Costa Rica. Uh, an applause from all of us to them. Please uh, come to the stage. We'll have a short presentation. I want you to uh, share what uh, climate change uh, role, uh, role uh, there is in your country. So please come here. So, we'll have the solutions. Let's start with a presentation from Nicaragua. Uh, we want to know what is uh, happening, what are the challenges in your countries, and uh, what are your ideas to solve it. I want you to share all that with uh, all of the young people here. Michael Molina, t tell us about what's happening in Nicaragua, please. Thank you. I hope you have enjoyed your lunch. I'm Mayra Molina. I am in the representation of uh, Good Neighbors. Nicaragua has uh, 6.5 million inhabitants. 66% are younger than 35. The project I want to present uh, is in the Santa Teresa and it's uh, characterized by high vulnerability to climate change. The principal sustain of this uh, region is agriculture and uh, cattle, 65% rural. We are working with uh, health and uh, environment areas. The impacts of uh, climate change have been uh, the hurricane E.T. and Ayayora with the growth uh, of rivers and floods and the landslides. And uh, people were affected and some people died. A member of our community too. Uh, then there are uh, long uh, droughts periods which affect all the families. The challenges here have been the, the fact that the communities have not been able to respond to the emergencies before, during and after. Uh, services are low and um, uh, all the different uh, places uh, to keep them in emergencies are not safe and the young people do not participate actively. The project I want to present today, it's called preparation to disasters with a community focus in Santa Teresa, Nicaragua. The project has 
four components. First is strengthening of capacities, uh, both at institutional and community level. Once the brigades are trained, we have to consider basic uh, equipment. Then we have to improve uh, the different uh, schools where people are located in emergencies. And then we have to develop um, a communication strategy for further development. Uh, most of uh, the people, uh, the beneficiaries, are young people. What do we need to put all this into working? We need technical assistance for early alert and we have to have each of the communities with their own risk control plan. Also, we need uh, communications. They, they have to find solutions and to be able to communicate. Then first aid and uh, tools to deal with disasters. Uh, the most important uh, part is improving uh, the places where, where people are sent uh, and in terms of communication, we need campaigns so that uh, uh, all the people know where are the emergency routes and monitoring, evaluation, accountability. We need a hundred thousand dollars for two years. And this is uh, with on uh, 2022 and 2023 development uh, project in Nicaragua. This could be escalated to other municipalities we are working at. Thank you very much, Maite and for his uh, adaptation and measures, I want to add should it the uh, Barrera to share what the solution can be. So, Judith, tell us about uh, your proposals. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Judith Barrera from El Salvador. It's really wonderful to be here on such an important date, the International Date of Youth. I belong to Rebelión Verde, Reverde, which is very similar to the colleagues over there. We were networking during lunch. We have several things in common apart from the name. It's a really important to meet. I, I have to rush so that Adriana doesn't complain. El Salvador is in Central America. We are neighbors. We are a small country, uh, 21,000 kilometers, uh, kilometers and 7 million people. I would like to tell you about the situation we are going through. We have an availability of 1,752 square meters. This is close to the 1,750,000 1, square meters of uh, water stress. This is contradictory because 
this last uh, year we have granted uh, 1,543 environmental permits. In El Salvador, we have developed uh, development uh, projects, but 1,586 environmental permits, the highest since 2018, and this can give you an idea, can give us an idea about the trends in order to favor uh, national and transnational companies that, that uh, are really taking all the waters, all the rainforest of our communities. The, FAO tells us that we are the, the uh, we are on the second place in terms of deforestation. So this is really complicated. Added to that, there's uh, climate change in El Salvador between 1990 and 2020. Climate change has uh, generated. Uh, yearly losses of 1% of uh, uh, PBI. This amounts to 247 million. We are talking about extreme climate change, uh, uh, incredible rains that uh, lead to uh, floods and also droughts. In 2014, we underwent a drought. So a lot of water or little water really has an impact on agriculture with losses for agriculture and farmers and uh, food becomes more expensive, scarce, and so does the uh, cost of living. And we, as young people, we also have the problems of uh, getting uh, jobs to make sure food is available. We are young people. I belong to Rebellion Verde. And before that, uh, I belong to Salvemos Valle El Ángel. Reverdes is made up of organized young people and we meet here to think collectively, to debate and to act. What we want to do is to think as young people and face all these facts. We really uh, bet on climate change. Who have talked about climate change? Adults, but it's important for us young people to fill up spaces and act my reality as a woman, as a young person, is that we also denounce and uh, show our position faced to different policies against the environment. We defend human rights and nature rights. And our idea is the right to life. Life is not only about people. Nature is alive and nature has rights. So we try to defend life in general. Our plans are uh, to defend all this we are organized in different regions. In the central region, 
we we have a focal people and we meet at this Reverde organization. El Salvador is divided in 14 departments. We are betting on a group of young people in each department talking about climate impact and warning about dangers. Once uh, we are more strong and adapted, we have to insist on resistance to climate change. We want to be together with these communities which are faced to uh, extractive industries. So we are trying to help all these communities. We are aware that raising our voices and opposing to project to big projects and big companies is a risk. And as young defenders, we have to be careful. Also, it's a double risk for women. So we also consider creating plans and mechanisms to take care of ourselves in a way that's organized and to share this with other countries. So, well, I hope I have been able to, to tell you what the situation is at El Salvador, and I want to invite you to visit us so that uh, we can uh, work together and make our uh, force stronger. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Now I will um, introduce a video from a representative of young people in Curaçao. We'll uh, introduce a video from uh, River Fast. I am the president of Youth for Climate Curacao, and I will be speaking here on behalf of the rest of the board from Youth for Climate Curacao. I am 15 years old, and I have lived on Curacao my entire life. I will also be presenting from the island Curacao, and for anyone that doesn't know where Curacao is or what the island is, um, it's an island in the Southern Caribbean next to Aruba and Bonaire. Um, you might know it from the liquor Blue Curacao. It's a very pretty island. A bit about our organization, Youth for Climate Curacao. Our organization is still quite new. It's about three years old. Um, it's mostly an, a group of youth, so high school students mostly from the island. Um, we focus on spreading awareness about the climate difficulties on our island. Um, and we also host cleanups and other events to raise more awareness. On our island, climate change has already had an effect. A few of the ways you can see this is by um, some reports from the Meteorological Department, which states that there have been less colder nights and there have been more hot days. Next to that, the average temperatures have also risen. This is also a cause for more coral bleaching in our oceans. And speaking about our oceans, there is not only pollution on our surface on the island, there's also quite a bit of pollution in the sea. Part of this pollution comes from all the sewage contents being dropped in the sea every day. Um, on our island, unlike cleaning the sewage contents or other ways of getting rid of it, it gets dumped straight in the ocean. It is predicted that in the future, the islands of Aruba, Bonaire, and Curacao, so those seven Caribbean islands, will become warmer and even drier. 
we have discussed ways of achieving a goal where our island is less polluted, has a prettier look for the tourists. We want to do this by putting pressure on our government. Let me explain this. Our entire island is very polluted. When you go to the streets, you see plastic bags hanging on the tree, you see Coca-Cola bottles somewhere on the street. And that's only on surface and the ocean is also terrible. And to think of one thing is that tourism is our main form of income. That is why our, we think our government sh should perform more because if the tourists come here, they should have a pretty scenery to look at. So the government should put more attention into cleaning up all that mess. Um, although our government has a great vision, there is unfortunately a failure to execute. Plans are only good intentions if they immediately degenerate into hard work, as Peter Drucker said. We do think that some organizations do a great job at trying to reduce all the trash and waste on our island, like Green Phoenix, Sea Turtle Conservation, Curso Cleanup, there are way more. But as long as our government doesn't find the people who dump their trash on the streets or keep littering everywhere, the trash will keep building up. The way we plan on achieving this goal is by, first of all, using social media as a resource. We want to show our government via social media how many people want change and how our island looks and how many people think it's a good idea to find people and put more controls on the island. We also think that with networking, we can get people of a, um, a higher status, I would say of more connection to our government to also convince them. Thank you very much for having me. This is the conclusion. Um, I thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed hearing from us. Thank you very much. Vamos a continuar entonces con este recorrido de soluciones de adaptación. Let's go on with the, all these solutions for adaptation. I will invite Mike Douglas from Panama. So I will ask all of you to, to be short because there are lots of people who want to talk and we have a short time. Uh, well, my name is Miguel Douglas. The earth is changing. We have to change. I am a member of the finance unit of a movement of uh, young people from Panama. Our context in Panama is a multicultural country with a great economic growth. Panama Republic has a tropical climate with rains that mark the difference between the rainy and the dry season. There are 4 million people, 25% is young people. Panama is a, there has a lot of biodiversity. It is close to South America. Uh, we have uh, the last uh, map of uh, rainforest coverage. We have 3% of uh, rainforest with 68% in Panama. Nevertheless, Panama has uh, a climate risk of vulnerabilities. This is the map of vulnerability index of uh, climate change in Panama. 
here on the map we can see the deeper uh, colored areas on the Pacific with um, high vulnerability to the increase of uh, sea level. There's also high exposure uh, to floods and the dry arc with high exposure to higher temperatures. We also have a study by the World Bank called uh, climate uh, risk and the uh, physical profile of countries where Panama ranks 14th as uh, countries at risk. In terms of adaptation to the climate uh, change, we know that uh, COVID was really a hard blow to all of us. No country were pre was prepared to this health crisis. Uh, that uh, has increased. Here we can see adaptation uh, uh, costs for climate uh, change. For 2030, the cost will be, and we can see the numbers on screen, and 2050, these numbers will go up. Adaptation costs will go from 150 to 300 million dollars for 2050. Panama is absorbing more emissions that it produces. Also, there's a solution about adaptation to climate change with financing. We have uh, talked about funds, but uh, there are changes in the uh, debt exchange for adaptation. There are resources to guarantee payment of the debt and uh, suppose the uh, government, ca uh, government cancels the debt of the other government and so the different countries are um, uh, trying to protect this. Uh, Nakura is an uh, ONG within the framework of the United Nations. What resources are necessary to implement these tools? As young people, we should pressure on governments to promote internationally uh, to banks the importance of uh, these uh, tools in order to uh, foster this uh, debt interchange. We, as young people, we have to learn more about economy and organizations in order to work in micro companies. I would also like you to invite to work in uh, climate uh, financing. Uh, you can find us at at their own. And within this economy, the, uh, within this academy, there's information for young people from 18 to 35 years old that depends on uh, an article that tries to conduct uh, economic flows. And in article number nine, there's uh, the need uh, to help developing countries. So young in Instagram, please uh, get there in order to, to to get there on Instagram. Uh, let's have a great day for all of us. Corriendo diferentes iniciativas y ahora le corresponde a Costa Rica, uno de los lugares más famosos que se llama el Bosque Nuboso de Monteverde. Quiero invitar a Camila Herrera para que comparta su iniciativa. Camila, por favor.
Bueno, este, buenas tardes. Eh, the main tool to work on environmental projects and initiatives is education, and that's what has brought me here. My name is Camila Herrera. I'm 16 years old, and I'm the coordinator of the youth group Green at Five with the Tropical Scientific Center of the Monteverde Reserve Forest. That is the map of Costa Rica. The lighter green is the Pajaro Campan Biological Corridor and the red spot is Monteverde. Monteverde is at the top of the Tilaran mountain range. Today in Monteverde, there is there are about 6,000 people. Monteverde is a beautiful place and it's a section full of ecosystems, biodiversity, animals and species. But something important is missing, and that is recreational and learning spaces for youth people and for everyone in the community. And so that's why the group was created, Reverde at Five. And here we see some of the members. One of the last um, cloudy forest is in Monteverde. It's one of the last ones in the world. That's very sad, but it's the reality. It's one of the last forests because as we know, the temperature is increasing. There have been a lot of changes in rainwater. So now is, it rains um, a lot and the soil doesn't have enough time to absorb so much water. And so Reverde at five, what we do is it's a... Uh, group of young people and what we do is we learn and train about environmental policy environmental matters where we develop skills to be able to better serve our community we do that through reforestation and volunteering and other initiatives with people in the community such as senior um, citizens we do tours with the initiative to learn about other projects that are also working on environmental matters. The solution as such is Freverde a la Cinco, but the idea is to create a mitigation network for climate change. In Monteverde, there are a lot of ideas and initiatives for adaptation, but the idea is to create a common network along with Reverde where we work together so that we don't duplicate efforts because that doesn't make any sense. So one of the things that we would get through that network would be community participation, interinstitutional partnerships, safe and healthy spaces for recreation, bringing scientific information to people in the community. We give technical contributions to existing commune, community projects. And one of the main things is that we achieve conservation goals. One of the necessary resources for that community network would be a coordinator or manager of community processes, technical training, a community room that has classrooms and um, access to digital platforms to carry out meetings. One of the initiatives by the Verde la Cinco is promoting ecological art for the conservation of the forest in Monteverde. We do that with a waste management workshop that we did in the waste management area in Monteverde, also resilient murals. That's an initiative where we do, did an artistic intervention to beautify our community. So what we did was we painted some small gathering centers in Monteverde and other communities around us. And one of the most important ones is reforestation because one of the impacts is deforestation due to cattle raising. So we did reforestation. Actually, we did that last year in a ranch that's a cattle, a ran, a cattle breeding ranch. And we wanted to create a biological corridor that connects two patches of forest with a green bridge that animals could cross through. Do we have any questions?
Muy bien, Camila. Y acá tenemos jóvenes y jóvenes bien jóvenes. Thank you. Um, Camila, we have some very young people today, and so we're going to continue. I'm going to invite Joyce Mendes, who's here from Brazil and Paraguay. She is a member of the panel on the Central um, Youth, Global Youth Center. I have two languages, three with my native Guarani. We're going to start, and I apologize if I if I say some things wrong in Spanish. I'm going to bring you some of that context, that reality from South America, particularly in a region that has been called the Chaco Paraguayo. Um, I would like to talk about Paraguay. It's a multicultural uh, country, 7.1 million people, 50% of the population is under 30 years of age. So the youth uh, force is present there and as are our demands. At the same time, this is a country that is uh, a high exporter of um, beef and soybeans. And one of the main challenges is deforestation. From 2018 to 2021, we had over 1 million hectares deforestated in the country. The region I'm going to be talking about is the region of El Chaco, the one that you see in the red circle. That's a semi-dry area where most of that cattle breeding exists. And where we're going to focus on the project that is already there and we need support to keep it going. These are some of the impacts, but the greatest one is basically that we are having a heat wave in winter. I wore winter clothes today because this temperature is very strange in Paraguay. Last week, what is that picture? It says 39 degrees Celsius in winter. In summer, last summer, we were at 50, 51 degrees Celsius was the highest temperature in Asuncion. People who don't have a car, who have to take public transportation, who have to uh, work for long hours with that heat. And many times, many homes have no air conditioning. So that's a lot of pressure, psychological, health-wise, we can't really perform. A lot of people say, why would you want to live here? You can go live somewhere else. But I don't want to migrate. I don't want to be a climate migrant, which will be 50 million by 2100. So adaptation is not an option. It's an obligation. And we see other extremes such as floods and droughts. And that is combined with the loss of production and other things. One of the projects that I want to share with you has been um, led by UNICEF with the support of the European Union. And it is basically thinking of that region of El Chaco as a region that doesn't have such so much access to uh, things like water and sewage and even power. The project has five pillars that you see on screen and they are basically focused on the training of teachers and community leaders in terms of risk management, first aid, also as part of the educational community starting to apply those behaviors, healthy behaviors, like I said, training in indigenous languages. It's not only Guarani, our second national language, but there are other languages like Ayoreo and others in the region where the message has to be um, conveyed to learn from the community. Then we have also made hydro sanitary improvements in the schools. We have organized task forces to work on sewage and water in El Gran Chaco, but we also want to be part of, to add monitoring those good practices and communicate them. And so these are some of the pictures of the project. And what do we need for continuity? technical support, but also financial support. We want to expand to other schools as part of those resilient schools, boys and girls from the Gran Chaco in Paraguay, and also involve more youth and more community leaders by training them to do advocacy with the local governments in terms of risk management and access to water and sewage and 
working together with the different water task forces because there are places where the government is not there, the community has to organize itself to have access to water and sewage, but also studies of habits and behaviors. As part of our indigenous cultures, there are many practices that can be rescued, such as growing crops and management and water um, management, but we want to, and we want to bring this forth, but also those indigenous messages and the plans for school risk management. So let me tell you, our reality is our country has no access to the ocean, but we have high temperatures with that variability that is so high and maybe we may have no more winters. So there is a high risk. Migrating is not an option, but we also want to learn with you. We want to share experiences. And we are here in case you want to support, develop a project in your community. We can guide you and share our experiences of our projects with our members. Thank you very much. That's wonderful. Let us then keep um, uh, keep going. And we now have Jose Villatoro from Guatemala. A lot of people say that climate change is not true. It's not real. But when we are seeing the consequences, it is no longer a mere option. It's a matter of survival. Hello, my name is Jose Villatoro and I'm from Guatemala. It's a, I'm very pleased to be here with you today. Thank you again for the invitation. I'm a climate activist and environmental activist and human rights activist. I'm part of different collectives and also of different organizations where we have developed actions to be able to amplify the voices and the actions of youth, particularly rural youth that is often overlooked. To give you a context of Guatemala, Guatemala is a multilingual pluricultural and multi-ethnic country that has 17.4 million inhabitants with a young population between 18 and 30 years of age, representing 61.9% of its population. In spite of being called the country of eternal spring because of its beautiful touristic locations, exotic animals, and great biodiversity of ecosystems, it's a highly vulnerable country when it comes to climate change effects. In Guatemala, there are a lot of impacts, very bad um, impacts, negative impacts because of climate change, including droughts and um, floods and storms, and that includes human losses, ecosystemic losses and economic losses. I'm from uh, an area called Huehuetango, which um, borders with Mexico specifically. It's one of the states with the greatest vulnerability to the effects and disasters of climate change over time. And one of the sectors that has been affected the most has been the agricultural sector. In Guatemala, agriculture is the most important productive sector because it represents, over the past 10 years, it has represented 14% of the national GDP because 61% of the population lives in the rural area. And this represents an active economic production, specifically agricultural with 58.6%, which would be the equivalent of 1.86 million people working in this sector. The World Bank has also um, prepared different, has done research where we have seen that ensuring agricultural production that can be resilient to climate disasters can reduce losses and damages, and it also can increase wealth and ensure 80% um, of food security. For example, in the year 2020 in Guatemala with Storm Eta and Storm Yota, in Guatemala, we had close to 136,761 hectares of crops that were lost as a result of this, unfortunately. And afterwards, this ended up affecting 
204,500 families because of all the impacts and losses due to these storms. And the solution that we are planning is to be able to have a financial investment through grants for losses and damages and technical assistance in agricultural sector projects that have been led by you, young people who have been affected by climate disasters because oftentimes the only livelihood for these families and these youth, which is the most um, economically active population, they no longer have the resources they need to be able to reinvest and to develop again. So the resources that we need to be able to implement would be access to grants for up to $15,000 in each of the projects that can be led, that are being led by youth in the rural area, focused on two calls for participation per year, depending on how much they generate every year, which is going to be an open um, participation process, open submission uh, in terms of the impact they have on climate disasters. The purpose is also the goal is to be able to promote old practices and knowledge, such as the use of native seeds and local varieties, plus contributing to food security and conservation and restoration of the soils. Because as we know, oftentimes the agricultural sector itself is not very environmentally friendly. So having all of these old practices, ancient practices in our own territories that have been done for many years is one of the main practices and goals to implement. And then providing technical support through a number of trainings to be able to improve our methodology and implementation of the project itself. Transparency in terms of fund allocation and also making the project sustainable over time in the medium short and long term for it to be regenerative and to be sustainable in the community itself. In addition to that, having the necessary resources to carry them out and the raw materials, which is the main thing that in the that is missing in the agricultural sector in rural areas. And to finish, we cannot adapt to extinction per se. The time to act is now. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And so our last speaker today is also from Costa Rica. Let us welcome Maria Jose Araya. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to start with a story that just came to mind, and that is the reason I'm here. I was born in the capital of Costa Rica in San Jose. And I always remember that in about 2000, one of my pastimes was to count how many referees would pass on the Aguila River, how many refrigerators would swim by in the Aguila River during floods. I'm an environmental engineer and I work with water management. In the case of Costa Rica, we call that asadas. There is a map of the area of influence of the project I'm collaborating in. We work with 190 rural aqueducts in the Atlantic territory, including states from Pocosí, Siquirri, Huasimo, Matina, Limón, and Turrialba has always been considered to be more on the Atlantic. And so we also work with Turrialba and Jiménez aqueducts. In this project, we have been working since 2020. The main stakeholders are Asadas uh, organized uh, in union, unions, federations, leagues, and unions of Asadas. We have three in the territory, UNAM, UNACAR, and UNATUHI. UNATUHI, we have a foundation, Foundation Avina, that has uh, experience in Latin America in water access projects. We also work with Costa Rica um, organizations and international cooperation to visibilize, to give visibility to the impacts on climate action that affect Asadas. In several parts of this territory, we have co entire communities that are subjected to water stress, 
with regulations of water consumption throughout the day. And when we have these floods and disasters, we have significant damage to the infrastructure of the aqueduct uh, systems, the lines of distribution, there are there is pollution, the pipes break, and these are some of the impacts that also end up contaminating or polluting the drinking water supply. Also, as a product, as a result of these environmental impacts, we have the contamination or pollution of our aquifers and underground water with emergent organic pollutants such as um, pest um, pest control chemicals and other ways. What we have been doing in SADAS in the Atlantic Territory, as you have been saying, the different frameworks of projects, we are strengthening strengthening the capabilities of the community leaders who are in charge of 35% of the water in Costa Rica, which is provided by SADAS. So what do we do? We support them in their risk management plans, identifying risks so that it isn't so late and in plans to act in the face of climate change with other um, companies that manage water and bring water to the communities, the things that they have to do. So what are the necessary resources working with Asadas or rural aqueducts? We know that we are working with public funds. So one of the initiatives, I don't know if you heard about it, is the very famous tariff for the protection of water resources, which is difficult to implement, but what we want to do is that through public funds, we would be able to protect the resources also from Sasagua because this is a third tier organization of aqueducts. We have the plus of being able to offer to Asadas final graduation projects, a community work with the public universities, Costa Rica, Nauset, UTEC, UTN, and others. And so it's um, a way of channeling academic resources through an academic center that has an incidence in a large territory. We saw that there are 190 asadas that are in this territory. Now, when an asada is able to manage the basic things, the administrative parts, the protection of the water resource is they want to do that, but we have many cases where we don't even have water. So at, the, at an administrative level, it's impossible to implement. So I'm writing here, what would they do if they have 20 or 30 kilometers of tube, uh, tubes, water pipelines, if there is no water to go through those pipelines? So that's what the project is about. Now, in terms of scalability, we currently have 17 federations, leagues, and unions of asadas in the country. So that would be asadas in Osa, they're called Ancaosa, or the Union of Asada Sinosa. We have the ones in the Caribbean, the uh, Western Pacific, one Asada, so another one, they realized they had the same difficulties and they decided to, to share experiences to get stronger. With this, um, the strengthening of these federations or leagues with these international cooperation projects, they have been implementing them through the Embassy of the United States and the Peru and the program of small donations, different centers of sustainability. There are five centers in the country. They are working now and we are working on another three to have coverage of the map that you see here with all the asadas that you see there. Every little drop is a rural aqueduct. And that is the point in the case of the Atlantic Territory Sesagua, which is the name that Asadas in the territory selected for their center, Center for the Sustainability of Water in the Atlantic, and that is the project that I work on. Right, thank you so much to all the young people who have shared their initiatives. Let us stand so we can take a group picture. Let's get together. Uh, a little closer together, and we want to invite the new presentation that is going to be by one of the institutions that works with vulnerable groups. So let us all get a little closer.
A round of applause, please, for everybody. And now I would like to welcome Matthew McKinnon, who is the head of programming the Climate Vulnerable Forum, CVF, that many of you have uh, are familiar with, and also Sarah Ahmed, who is the financial advisor of B20. So we're talking about international cooperation, we're talking about collaboration, cooperation, solutions, and so we want to invite them to share the experience of what is being done, not only in Costa Rica, but also in many other countries throughout the world. Matthew, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being with us. Please, the floor is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry. So, um, uh, we were going to do like a whole 30 minute interactive thing, but the whole conference is going a little bit over time. So actually, Sarah and I, and we're here with our colleagues, um, Javier Diaz, who, who is based in San Jose, and uh, Maria Jose Vasquez, who uh, is from Costa Rica, but is um, based in the headquarters of GCA. Um, uh, because we're working with different governments of this uh, Climate Vulnerable Forum, which is the 55 countries most threatened by climate change who band together to try and push the world to take action on climate. Like, for example, um, this is the group that pushed to have a 1.5 degree goal in the Paris Agreement and is the, the group that keeps pushing for different action to happen in the world to fight climate change. And it was recently presided by Bangladesh. They've now handed over to Ghana. And Bangladesh came up with this concept that being vulnerable countries um, is a little bit like um, being like a least developed country. You don't want to be a vulnerable country. You want to actually end up somewhere else. So um, countries like Costa Rica are incredibly vulnerable to climate change, but where you want to be is actually heading towards being prosperous despite the climate challenges and to seize the opportunity of a transition to um, something different. So they came up with this program called Climate Prosperity Plans. So we're working with all these different governments to help them uh, find their way to a plan for more prosperous development. Part of this, we're having meetings with different ministries in San Jose next week, and we're gathering um, answers to different questions. And I'll pass over to Sarah in a second to explain this. But basically, um, this is a questionnaire which you can fill out in your own time. And ideally, if by like the end of your Mother's Day weekend, <laughs> if you could have your answers in, or Monday morning, um, then we would have a chance to look at them. Um, but it's very similar questions that we're asking experts in different ministries in Costa Rican government and experts in different ministries and other governments around the world to try and find priorities and challenges to overcome uh, when building a, a new national strategy to fight climate change that would also be like a prosperity strategy. Um, so I'll hand over to Sarah, she will explain um, a little bit more about this. Um, and the types of questions you could anticipate to see there. But, uh, you know, this is your youth forum, so we're actually just really interested in your opinions rather than to talk to you for 20 minutes. So we'll then just disappear and you guys can go on with the program. And we will really look forward to see what answers you come with to these, I think, seven questions, right? Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Matthew. Um, yeah, so I, I imagine most people here are under the age of 35. Uh, and so what's critical here is the investment that's being made from now up to 2030 will determine what happens in 2040, 2050, and onward. 
Um, and so the questionnaire includes seven questions, including what are the key challenges Costa Rica is facing between now and 2030? What are key priorities? Um, what are important uh, projects and programs that are relevant to climate? Um, what are some of the ambitious projects and programs you would like to see? Uh, what sectors are most impacted by climate change? Uh, and what are the main challenges to the low carbon transition, uh, such as logistics, transportation, and uh, challenges as well in adaptation, uh, including the, the cost of, of the, the initial cost uh, to adapt? Um, and also, what are the main sustainable development priorities for Costa Rica? So hearing from you would be really important, considering that um, this would impact your lifetimes the most. Um, yep, yeah, I think that's, that's all from, from us, and hope you have a good uh, rest of the day and conference. Thanks a lot. Muchísimas gracias. Eh, and thank you very much. Max. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, vamos a continuar con esta nueva actividad. Esta va a ser una actividad interactiva. En ese momento, entonces, this uh, will be an interactive activity. We will invite uh, the guys from the uh, Young People's Network. Uh, this activity will be uh, related to how to imagine a resilient continent, which are the five actions you think are necessary for this uh, uh, project of a resilient Latin America to become possible. So now I give the floor to the facilitator for this new session. Hello. Hello. My name is Raquel Sagot. I think this is really challenging. We have to imagine the future in 2030. I guess you are a bit tired. I will clap three times and we will shout uh, climate action. One, two, three, let's wake up. Climate action. I want you to definitely wake up. Climate action. Yes, now you are fully awake. It's really important. Uh, you can remember our colleague talking about uh, mental health. Uh, this is a bit what happens to us when uh, we get into the feeling of uh, uh, no of knowing what uh, climate anxiety is for 2030 who of us have had uh, some kind of depression for what is happening in the planet this is what we have to face this is what we have to talk about in order to find collective answers we will do this exercise to break the barrier of climate anxiety in order to define affirmative action from young people in the country. Please, I need some music now. Close your eyes. We'll do something that is called insight, sort of a guided meditation in order to dream deeply. Close your eyes. Get into the depths. It's very big, filled with space. There's peaceful for some people. You want to open your eyes right now. For others, they want to stay there. This is what we feel in 
climate crisis, uncertainty, fears, we feel paralyzed. When you have these paralyzed feelings is where we have to find our safe spaces, our neighborhoods, our houses, our trees, flowers, mushrooms. As an exercise, let's take our mind to another place. Let's find ourselves in our territories where we find love and safety, the places we fight for, the reason why we are here, where we uh, feel wonder and happiness. The reality in the planet sometimes seems different from us. Let's think about the next 10 years ahead. Let's get this uh, peaceful feeling uh, we get from being in a safe space. Let's think about 2030. We have to change to an inclusive society where collective welfare is the most important. From our communities, this change started. We knew the different ecosystems and needs in our territories. We knew what the key actions were to find the necessary changes. We understood humanity. We understood the ener energy flows in order to understand the planet. We are caring for the people, for the systems, for the inequality situations where difficult things happen. So that's how we can get into a specific proposal. This is fighting climate crisis. Let's grasp this objective and open your eyes. So now we were able to visualize safe spaces and think about 2030. Now you will see some questions. Mm, you can uh, use uh, these uh, color files uh, for the answers or uh, your computers with the mentis. This maybe could be uh, differentiated funding for young people. Sometimes we are asked for seven years experience when we ask uh, funding for our projects. They want uh, organizations that are perhaps four years old. These uh, are really barriers. We have to let people know that those are barriers for us. Let's imagine, think of one word to say how you imagine an Ameri uh, Latin America and the Caribbean, which is uh, resilient to climate change after 2030. Think of five key actions that can be implemented to, to give decision makers and say, these are key actions here and now. So please write uh, the actions on your papers and I will give the floor to different people so that uh, they tell us about uh, the reality of their territories. We have had some connection problems, but if you don't want to write, you can uh, give your answers here on Menti. Imagine a America Latina de los 
Let's imagine our dream Latin America. If we all are able to go from conscience to action as the letter of the earth and being able to uh, act and to get to a multi-level dynamic situation. At the stands, there are some uh, whiteboards you, uh, where you can write your ideas and suggestions. Would you like to give your answers to say how you imagine this uh, dream Latin America and the Caribbean that is uh, a place apt for development of everyone? Yo Costa Rica, bueno, América Latina y el Caribe 2030 lo, move, lo vería como una movilidad sostenible. I would see Latin America and the Caribbean as a sustainable place where every every place is safe, clean and accessible for the population. Sometimes uh, we forget uh, handicapped people, handicapped physically or mentally, because uh, our world is made for normal people. And also in uh, rural areas, I'm from Perrin, and and sometimes uh, ecological uh, solutions uh, only apply to big cities. We suppose when we talk about pollution, uh, it's uh, because uh, garbage collectors don't uh, get to your place, but our solutions have also to apply to rural areas in Costa Rica where most people uh, live and where the food that uh, is uh, eaten by most of the people and food safety. We cannot have food waste in some places and to have hunger in other places. I can see a Latin America that's healthy and happy. Thank you very much. We can see an inclusive Latin America accessible in all territories. We have worked on community projects so that young people can uh, visualize this situation. We have to work together to make this true. Anyone else like to share actions? I will pick up uh, your files in a second. Well, Latin America, I can imagine in 10 years time, is an ecological Latin America. In Costa Rica, we have a strong investment in education in Costa Rica, but in Mexico, we can see people who are 20 or 30 years old and they have not finished primary school in Colombia, in Brazil, with large populations who cannot read or write and not 
because they they want to but uh, that's because of lack of access to education and they ha they had to work so i want to imagine a Latin America where we have work uh, solutions which are sustainable. Some uh, solutions are not sustainable in 15 years. Then uh, talking about a neuronormative world, I suffer from autism. I was stigmatized. I was accused of being weird or homosexual. Not homosexual is not a bad thing, but it's a stigma because the way I talked was special. So I had this stigmatization. There was bullying about that. There was a teacher who said that uh, my situation was special and that in fact led to bullying. I want a Latin America where there's equality about uh, rights, uh, reproductive rights and free from stigmas. Our society has stigmas I mean, there are stigmas anywhere in the world, but in Latin America, this is a fact. And the third thing is to be aware, education, environment, and the food security. In Latin America, it's the most unequal region in the world. We all know that or not. Yes. So precisely, we need a Latin America where we make sure that the three basic foods are present. Here in Costa Rica, there are people who cannot uh, eat uh, meats or, or vegetables, sometimes uh, children do not have uh, the guarantee of having the three meals. And I think that uh, children's rights include uh, food security. That's something we need, not only food security, but guaranteeing the rights of happy and healthy children for all Latin American uh, children so that they can all have happy memories of their childhood, which is not a fact right now. So inclusion, representativity, territoriality, I can see that I can see you writing. So that's good to take to the. Would anyone want to take the floor? Bueno, buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Kenneth Mayorga. Soy del territorio indígena Abriuri de Talamanca. I am from Talamanca. For me, the most specific, the most important thing for Latin America with a better future is to be aware and hopeful. I I saw the suicidal. Uh, I I remember someone mentioned suicidal things in Talamanca. So I had to take action. So I went to Consejo de Mayores, and they helped us 
find uh, our native young, uh, young community to get out of this hole. What we needed was prevention, but that, that was the cultural awareness. So I would like to go back to was Alberto Jorge Alvarez and former president, he said, let's go back to the earth. That's where the knowledge is so that our continent is not as beaten by climate change. My ancestors helped me protect mother earth. I have to go back to them. I, I don't have to learn, I have to remember in order to protect area, which is Mother Earth. Thank you very much. Mm, this is really interesting. We are the international muscle. It's sort of on our shoulders. Uh, our muscle is really strong. Hola. Bueno, eh, Hello. aquí Luis Francisco Ledesma de Funga Luis Francisco Ledesma from Funda Conservation. I think we need what we are promoting as bio uh, learning. This was born in our cast. I will start again. In Guanacaste, they apply in the biological education proposal and this uh, bio learning. This is really necessary for the population who does not know about biodiversity in Costa Rica, they, they should value more the biodiversity around us. Here in Costa Rica, 95% of the people can read and write, but uh, most people cannot understand what's happening in the rainforests or suppose so about uh, mushrooms. We have been uh, trying to help on an environmental place so, as, so that people can see the solutions that nature can give us. Thanks to knowledge and scientific knowledge that we have developed in Costa Rica, we can react to, uh, to climate change, but this uh, knowledge is not being communicated to the, the different communities. So with this uh, proposal of bio learning, we will find uh, um, a point in common about educating people and getting education from people from their um, ancestral knowledge, as uh, our native colleague said, because ancestral knowledge gives uh, many answers. Now we have scientific and technical knowledge, which is not being communicated to uh, the general population. And this bio uh, learning about uh, bacteria, uh, fungus, for instance, now we are 
developing a thesis so that vegans who cannot access B12 vitamin can get them through bacteria. This is happening now at the University of Costa Rica. There are many vegans needing B12 and all this proposal can go with the technology that is coming as part of all this awareness and technical knowledge in Costa Rica. So that's why it's important to have um, a country with uh, bio learning as a priority. So that's where we see uh, hybridization of knowledge and uh, we can generate key actions. I think it's important to talk about training. Sometimes there's training, but there's no circular economy uh, sort of keeping all this uh, training going. I come from a rural area and that would be important so as not to have to emigrate. This could be important. I think what is really important is to get green jobs. I'm interested in green jobs. Uh, there's there are a lot of job opportunities there, not only for us who are privileged and we have been to university, but also to other people because they there are people who can have ideas and suggestions for climate change and also universal sensitivity. Sometimes in rural areas, where people cannot see the, the needs about ramps or accessible tourism. So probably it would be important to have a 3D uh, images, suppose of, uh, of what is happening. And this would allow circular economy. I'm sorry that we have run out of time. It's interesting to reflect and to have an introspection to get all these actions. We have to see uh, our lives as young people because we have to take actions. We have to involve in development with other uh, young people, for instance, since the Red de Juventudes, we want to work together and bring other young people to live peacefully in a place where we are represented and when everyone has rights, be handicapped people, all people. Thank you very much. We will get uh, your color papers. I'm very happy to have shared this space with you and uh, let's hope we can make it. Thank you.
we are looking for the letters that were left. If you have them, please, we need them. Thank you in the back. Dicen que tenemos más tiempo, chiquillers. <laughs> so we've just been told that we can keep going. We have more time. Let's take advantage of that time. I know there, there were several people who wanted to talk. So Onyx, I know you wanted to talk. We have a microphone back there. Why don't you bring it up, bring it up to him, Onyx? right there. I wanted to talk about the five actions. One was similar to what others said, differentiated research. For example, I'm part of the LGBTQ plus population and there is no climate research related to diverse community. I know that we exist, we will continue to resist until we are included in research and data. In addition to differentiated research, funding for that research is needed today. FES is at risk. There is a significant cut um, down of the budget and something that allows territorial investigation is the FES. That's also important, adaptation based on current and future climate. At Medina, there have been housing projects that haven't been done based on future climates. There are today social housing projects that were not done with projections of even a decade out. A decade ago, they would not flood, but one of them floods today. One of them is El Porvenir, it's in the department of uh, Matina. So now there are new communities that did not used to be at risk or vulnerable and are at risk and vulnerable today, and they're not going to be relocated. Those are social projects that are only 10 years old and were not even done um, in high areas because they didn't plan with a future projection. Clean air. Sometimes we have the idea that in the coast, in the periphery, there is clean air, but let me tell you that's not true. Banana producers pollute, and one of the pollutants is chloroperifos, and that is present. And we have that uh, study thanks to this university that has a territorial presence, the University of Costa Rica does research, and when I did research at the Matina uh, area, and they discovered that 25% of the schools that are nearby at one kilometer or less than banana companies are polluted or the air is polluted by this component. And guess what causes this component? Hyperactivity, it causes, uh, what this component causes is hyperactivity, pregnancy issues. And so we have all of these things that have to do with mental health and they are not being looked into because clinics don't have a psychology professional or a social work professional and so that's still missing and lastly resilient infrastructure i live in matina in the district of matina and the the pipeline that brings water are hanging from uh, oh, in the in the trench and so if there is some um, heavy rainfall the pipelines will break and we are left without water. And so infrastructure, resilient infrastructure is very important if we want to have inclusive adaptations. So my work was democratization, democratization of adaptation, democratization of research, democratization of infrastructure and knowledge and democratization of knowledge. Without democratization, there is no fair climate action. Thank you, Onyx, thank you. And now we are ready to go to someone else. Thank 
Once again, good afternoon, everybody. On behalf of the originary peoples in Buenos Aires, Punta Arena, in the Bunka region, and also representing the discourse that we have uh, from the indigenous groups. Hello, Kenneth. I think you have a clothing project, if I'm not mistaken. And why do I bring this up? Because he has had to go out to get training to, to start um, as an entrepreneur. So that's one of the movements that are outside of the territory as well. Why do I want to talk about a proposal for Costa Rica? Because it's important, as Kenneth has said, to claim the cultural memory for indigenous peoples, for indigenous um, individuals who are outside of the territory near archaeological sites. What is needed? We need to buy with um, national funds or international cooperation those lands so that we can work with the on food sovereignty because indigenous people know how to work on the land they don't need to be taught what they need is food sovereignty being given the resources the seeds so that in their hectare they can also have their house because many of our uh, indigenous people are in vulnerable situations so housing and crops and what was mentioned by someone else earlier reforestation then we can talk about how we can from an indigenous cosmovision contribute to climate change thank you Thank you for your contribution. I think this, um, we have someone else who would be the last person. Well, my name is Sebastian, I'm 13 years old. I'm here with Atlantic College and I wanted to talk about the integration of larger scale projects. So that would be micro companies. And I think many students in this university have micro companies. They have um, stores and Instagram stores. Big brands are doing a lot of seasonable clothing manufacturing. It's beautiful and cheap, but six months later, it's worn out. And yesterday I was watching a video about how it would be better to buy luxury items than cheap clothing because it it lasts longer and also supporting the micro businesses of this country is very important for example a few months ago i went to a market with some college students american clothing and things like that. i think the government should support those micro businesses with markets that are not designed by the owners but the government to give them a space to work and i would also like to talk about reducing using solar panels for carbon dioxide emission reduction. They are expensive, but they are very beneficial. At school, we were talking about that. And there was someone who had solar panels, but it was very expensive to maintain. And so they had to remove them. And I also talked to my professor about that, bringing that to the schools, but it was very expensive. So I think the government should find a way to reduce the price so that everyone could have solar panels. Thank you. How wonderful to have youth representation in space in spaces. We bring in um, projects and we have to think about how to do them. And so our voices need to be heard and they have to be brought to representation spaces. And so let's keep all of this in mind, we will continue to work on this. Thank you for the space. Thank you so much, Rachel, for such a, a great inspirational session and to all of you for raising your voices. We are now getting close to the ending of this 
Forum for Adaptation to Climate Change among the youth of Latin America in commemoration of the National Youth Day from San Jose, Costa Rica. And so I would like to invite the people who are going to join us in this closing ceremony. Natalia Gomez, who is the president of the Climate Change and Youth Network of Costa Rica. Joyce Mendez from the panel on GCA for support in youth topics. And also, we want to invite our host, Pascal, representing the University of Costa Rica. Javier Diaz, who is a senior fellow for Latin America and the Carib Caribbean for CDF and GBA. And also, Eva Fleming, who has been working with me day and night to make this event a reality in the other seven regional forums. She comes from the Netherlands. She is Dutch and also a youth leader. Let us now get started with this closing ceremony. We're going to start with a video that we have from the representative of the presidency of uh, COP27 that this year is going to be led by Egypt. Who can help us play the video? And in the meantime, as we prepare the video, I'm going to ask Eva to answer a question, which is, what's next? What happens after this, Eva? Hello, everybody. Um, so nice to meet you and to have engaged with conversations with you during the lunch breaks, during the coffee breaks, and to hear your pitches. It's been really, truly uh, inspiring is an overused word, but really it's been truly inspiring to uh, come here and learn from you. So what's one of the key things today, I think, is that it's not enough to only speak about climate justice and to hear about all these ide amazing ideas, but that it's also about what happens next and how are we going to make sure that everything we've heard today, we also start implementing and we start advocating. So I'll share with you three things, which um, as part of the Global Center for Adaptation, which we will do, uh, and which I warmly invite you to join us in doing. So the first is we're building a youth adaptation movement. We call it the Youth Adaptation Network. You will find it on our website, gca.org. And we're trying to connect young people from around the world to really join forces and make sure that together we are loud and we are bold when we call for climate adaptation. Secondly, we uh, have a newsletter, very practically, you can subscribe to our newsletter and you'll learn about what's happening in different parts of the world. You'll learn about, uh, we can also share your projects to make sure that more people know about what you are doing. And thirdly, all these forums, this is the closing forum, all of these seven forums have been leading up to influencing international negotiations and influencing world leaders. And so uh, on 3 1 September, the GCA Youth Dialogue on Adaptation Action is taking place in Rotterdam, the Netherlands, but you can also join it virtually and there will be ways for you to interact virtually through this. So you are very warmly invited to join the youth adaptation movement and I hope to, to stay in touch and to learn, continue learning from you. Thank you. Mil gracias, and thank you very much, Eva. For your hard work. Bueno, vamos entonces a continuar con la... So we are ready to continue with the closing ceremony. I would like to ask our technical assistance if we are ready to play the video. The video comes from an Sam, who is a representative of the COP27 presidency 
that will take place this year in Egypt, COP27. I'm pleased to speak to you today on behalf of Egypt's incoming presidency of COP27, taking place next November in the city of Shermanshi. Let me at the outset thank and congratulate Global Center on Adaptation. We were thrilled to learn that GCA is putting together a series of youth-focused adaptation dialogues. We are further thrilled that these dialogues started from Africa and trotted the globe to conclude with young people from Latin America and the Caribbean. And in this vein, the COP27 presidency is looking forward to the Global Youth Adaptation Summit to be held in the city of Rotterdam, 3rd and 4th September 2022. Distinguished participants, our meeting today comes weeks after the release of the sixth assessment IPCC Working Group to report on impacts, adaptation, and vulnerabilities. Described by the UN Secretary General as an atlas of human suffering, the message is very clear, and indeed we need to feel alarmed and deeply concerned that we are significantly off track and that the window of opportunity is rapidly closing. Adverse impacts of climate change are already here and cumulatively increasing in all regions and across all sectors, making us live already in an era of loss and damage. Latin America and the Caribbean region are among the strongly affected. Some progress is made on adaptation, but it is furthest from enough. Time is running out, resources are dismal, and adaptation limits are fastly approaching. Sharm el-Sheikh is expected to be the cop of implementation. Adaptation should be at the heart of implementation, discourse, and action. The two years Glasgow Sharm el-Sheikh work program on the global goal and adaptation was launched and will go through a series of policy and technical dialogues. Many voices are calling for seeing a qualitative accomplishment on the GGA discussions at Sharm el-Sheikh before the conclusion of the process at UAE in 2023. And first and foremost, there is a need for a transformative adaptation agenda. We look forward to your valuable engagements, inputs and submissions on the road towards a GGA that captures your concerns, priorities and challenges and showcase the best practices of youth-led global and local resilient solutions. Meanwhile, it is imperative to continue to demand sufficient, meaningful, accessible, predictable, balanced, and appropriate climate finance for adaptation. The 50-50 mitigation adaptation climate finance must not be a theoretical construct, and the Glasgow pledge to double adaptation finance should be honored and sustained. As COP27 presidency, we committed ourselves to a science-based, balanced, transparent, and inclusive leadership that promotes equitable progress on all fronts and encourages a drive for additional ambition and strength and resilience. In addition, the momentum created in Glasgow needs to be maintained and geared towards implementation. Our objective and vision will greatly benefit from the input from, from and engagement with all stakeholders. And as a country with extended commitment to youth empowerment, and as the annual host of the World Youth Forum in Sharm el Sheikh, we will strive to ensure that youth are at the heart of this conversation, as key contributor to policy planning and implementation, as well as being most affected by the future impacts of the decisions we make today. For these reasons, we are very glad that it was mandated to have an annual youth-led forum starting from Sharm el Sheikh in cooperation with UNGU and UNFCCC Secretariat. Egypt aspires that this forum and the COP itself provide a conducive environment for, to all of you to network, disseminate, impart and receive knowledge, speak up and exert the right level of pressure on governments and all stakeholders. I say this while looking forward to recurrent and dynamic conversations with you before, during and after Sharm el -Sheikh. I thank you. I would like to invite Joyce Mendez to give us a brief message of closing. Dear youth, colleagues, and participants, we want to, uh, and, and um, those who have been young for a long time, I don't want to say you're old. I want to thank you for these seven, seven spaces that we have had along with the GCA, and I want to ask you to discuss more. In South America, we hear very little about what Central America is doing and their youth are doing. 
and even more so with the region of the Caribbean. There are many things that we can share. We have similar realities, also similar challenges. Our history has a process of colonization that has left us with consequences that we are facing today. But the key, as we have heard, we have it. We know what to do, how to do it. And I hope that we can exchange more of these experiences. And going back to what our colleague has said, please join the Youth Adaptation Network, get the newsletter, connect, because there are many opportunities and events. But it's also important that what happens in um, Latin and in, in Central America and Costa Rica goes out to the world, not only as a government, but as youth, as an example of what can be do, done and what we can do. We hope that we see a Latin America that is more resilient. Thank you very much for being here. And now I would like to ask Natalia Gomez to address the audience. This has been a tremendous effort, not only by Natalia, but the entire group of the Youth Network of Costa Rica. They have been working days and nights for weeks and months to make this possible with every challenge, with all the difficulties, but with a conviction, which is that when we have an idea and we do things with passion and because we believe it is possible, everything is transformed. And this space was created full of illusion and ideas and energy. Natalia, to you and every member in the network, Youth Network of Costa Rica, thank you. Thank you for receiving Latin America. Good afternoon, everybody. It's uh, I'm very, very happy to be sharing this space with you, not only because we achieved the goals that we set for ourselves as an organization as we started creating this event, but also because in this road, as it relates to climate change, we see things that also almost make us want to run away because there isn't an encouraging future in the landscape. And the news, unfortunately, are not just seeking um, to attract attention. What we see and what we read gives us a, an idea of what's happening. Nothing is encouraging. And so that causes, that makes us feel upset and angry. And we are, it's okay. And we, it's, it's perfectly justified to feel that way. But we also have the possibility to channel all of these emotions. Fortunately, along the way, we find other people who dream, who advocate, and who roll up their sleeves, and they work for this. With huge projects, we find people who have the will to encourage these spaces, such as the ambassador of the Netherlands. People who are working on huge projects like the Global Center on Adaptation, the Vulnerability Forum, the University of Costa Rica, Ruta del Clima, Voces para el Clima, Buenos Vecinos, and, and many other organizations that accompanied us throughout the session. This morning, the ambassador was saying the future cost of inaction is just too high. We have this very clear because this is our reality, the hydrometeorological ex extreme phenomena and the impacts due to climate change, including heat waves, the, the, the thawing of the glaciers and extreme rainfall are affecting Latin America and the Caribbean from the Amazon to the Andes. IPCC always based on science tells us that water availability is more and more threatened in the world. According to the Worldwide Meteorological Organization 2021, exceeded records in greenhouse gas concentrations. The increase of sea level and the carbon content of the oceans. So adaptation is urgent and necessary. This is the true scenario that we have inherited. So the only possibility is action. We have to be emphatic that the need for action is now, is today. And it is young people who are in charge of this, not as a favor, not as a hobby, not as a volunteer opportunity. It is a basic survival need. 
And so we work without pay, without permanent resources, and normally without getting anything for it. But if the young people were not to do the work that we do, which is so serious and important, maybe it would all stop at a blah, blah, blah. So that's why the work of the youth in all the organizations that are represented here in the spaces of work for climate action at all levels in developing capabilities and volunteering at various communities should be recognized and uh, compensated fairly to finish millions of people are exposed to food insecurity and problems with drinking water, in addition to millions of migrants who are forced to leave their land for climate reasons. In Central America, we have lots of stories about this. Having a healthy environment is a human right. That's how it should be understood, adopted, and demanded and so should be adaptation for climate change from the climate from the youth network in costa rica we thank you for your support interest for this first forum for climate change adaptation for youth in latin america and the caribbean as we live today let us remember that we are not alone in this let us remember that young people are agents of change and that we have to share what we know in communities. We should work together. We should work in networks, in collectives to speed up actual climate action for and by youth. Happy International Youth Day. Thank you, everybody. What a wonderful message. And so I would like to continue with the words of Pascal Giro as our host in the University of Costa Rica. Pascal. Thank you, Adriana, and our colleagues from the main table. Dear friends, I'm here speaking on behalf of Maria Laura Arias, who is the Vice Provost of Research of the University of Costa Rica, who, because of an emergency meeting called by the Provost, because of the situation with the negotiations on the Special Fund for Higher Education, was unable to join us in this closing ceremony in this Latin American Forum on Youth and Climate Change. But she has authorized me to share, to share this closing message with you as an institution, as the hosting institution of this wonderful forum that we had today. As we finish a very exciting day in the framework of this forum on adaptation for the youth in Latin America and the Caribbean, we are filled with hope around adaptation for climate change and the leadership role of that young people are undertaking. The University of Costa Rica is grateful for the trust of the Global Center on Adaptation for selecting our university as the venue to host this relevant forum which consisted of the end event in a number of regional consultations to collect the perspectives and insights of the young people about adaptation policies and their adaptation. In representation of our provost, Dr. Gustavo Gutierrez Espeleta, in my position, I would like to thank you for, I would like to thank everybody for their participation, all the young people who have joined us at UCR and those who have traveled from other places for this commitment to youth throughout the world by taking specific actions today. I would like to highlight the importance of dialogue and, and sharing of ideas to foster collective action for the adaptation of, to climate change, particularly from a young voice. But I also, hear the this voice that is strong 
and loud in demanding social, environmental, and climate justice for the future. It couldn't be any other way. This is the voice that moves us as a university to commit ourselves in the fight for climate change for the benefit of current and future generations. It is this very strong voice in any language in the world that is able, able to mobilize millions of young people as we have seen in previous regional consultations and I, as I am certain has happened today and will happen in November in the next conference of the United Nations on climate change in COP27 in Shamershek in Egypt. On this International Youth Day 2022, we make a special reflection about solid intergenerational solidarity and the gaps that are created by age discrimination affecting the benefit of the entire population. We acknowledge that there are significant challenges in mitigating adult centrism of other conversations that leave out other groups such as child, children and teenagers and seniors whose voices are quieted down with excuses related to age. These challenges keep us from having a truly accessible, truly prepared world for the entire society at large. And so intergenerational solidarity is key because it allows us to have a better sense of social connection, taking advantage of the strengths, the knowledge, and the capacities and capabilities of every generation. Climate change today is a topic that affects everyone because there are populations whose ancestors lived in the same place and now have to be displaced because of the effects on climate because there are children whose future depends on the solvency of their communities and many of them are more and more affected for the same reason because there are young people who have dreams and want to do things and their development depends on is affected by the impact of climate change on policies and development. And so this is a crisis where no one is left untouched and it will affect even more so those who are more vulnerable. This is an urgent challenge. The clock of climate change cannot wait any longer. And that's why we are very proud with the initiative by youth to work on climate change. We want to say that it, that it is right to raise your voice as loud as possible in the world. There are so many collective commitments and signatures, but the actual changes never happen. The global goal of adaptation to strengthen resiliency and reduce vulnerability in the face of climate change requires more voices to be added to involve a number of actors who can make this a reality. You today give us truly a lesson in hope that it is possible to overcome the rampant pessimism and move towards action. And it is a message of hope that is cross-generational. As university people, we acknowledge the important role that our community has in terms of technological innovation and the transfers of knowledge with a focus on adaptation, both from our work in teaching and research and social action. Our own university has worked on plans and policies to make these processes sustainable from the beginning. And so our message to the youth is in terms of contributing specific points of action that can multiply their implementation and bring novel solutions, particularly thanks to your extraordinary capability of international and intergenerational dialogue, rather than leaving additional burdens to those who already have to deal with climate change. We want to make the road easier for us and I think today has been an example of that because we know that you will be the ones who will be making decisions tomorrow 
Latin America and the Caribbean has given you a vote of confidence in demanding urgent, immediate, and integral solutions. Keep going forward in your work towards COP27 to bring this message to all the youth in the world in order to get a true transcendental intergenerational dialogue. All of our support and gratitude. Thank you. And to close this event, I would like to I want to invite one of the people that helped in the creation of this event. At first, we started in Africa, we ended in Costa Rica, and we have a great help with uh, Javier Diaz, ambassador always working in foreign relations and he has really opened up spaces for us. He was really a great help in this event and making all these possibilities come true. We, thanks to you, were able to reach international agencies, uh, the government of Costa Rica, the University of Costa Rica, the network of young people. I'm telling you because good ideas can really resonate in other people. So Javier, it's really an honor to have you here with us, please. Let's give a big applause to Javier. Thank you very much. It was very kind of you. This is really an intergenerational dialogue. All you down there and uh, I am the least young of all of you. I have taken some notes that I wanted to share with you. I'll try to be short, but really I enjoyed so much the eloquent words of all the people before me. Good afternoon, young people of Latin America, Costa Rica and the Caribbean. It's been really an honor for me as part of the team of the GCA and the Forum of uh, Climate Vulnerability, which I represent for the Caribbean and Latin America. This is such a significant activity today. This is an intergenerational dialogue between uh, the people who have been working uh, for a long time on uh, climate change and you who have the future of our planet in your hands. I'm really pleased to see your commitment to solutions on climate impact on our economies. Your participation in the negotiation together with the old voices, as our representative from Salvador said, it's us. It's really mandatory that young people organize together, really help us in this negotiations on climate change. In 1919, the world was leaving the First World War and the communities were together to create a union of nations. Now we are facing another war. 
climate change. I would like uh, you to create a league of young people in Latin America and the Caribbean against climate change. I hope you can get to create a global league of young people in adaptation to climate change in order to really influence our agencies. Thank you very much for participating so actively. You have filled this space, this forum with the energy and with knowledge. All you have said uh, has been uh, gathered and it will be presented in Africa, in Egypt. So enjoy the rest of the day, you all. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. I would like to invite uh, the people from uh, the network. Some of them are, were running, trying to get everything ready, but Andrea and the rest, please come so that we can give a round of applause to them. Please come here, please. Let's give them a big round of applause to all of them. And please stand I also want to thank the technician, the cameraman, all the institutions, translators that have made this event possible. You can sit. Please hold your hands. <laughs> 